I really got back into it in like those two months because I just had those like little like sort of hour long therapy sessions at the end of the day of where you just sit down and you get your model and you keep bashing all painting and then the world stops existing. Yeah. It's like this is everything. If I got a warlord, you lot would be okay with that, right? If I <laughs> it would be funny. It would at least be funny in that case. That being said, I've now got the, the title for the video. That's I'll play Rage and Legends for a Warlord Titan. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel and welcome to another saga. Um, we have another special guest in the studio today that we're going to talk to very soon. We're really excited to have this person who you've probably seen in the past in chat as well, which is incredible. If you're watching this at the point in which it goes live first on YouTube, thank you so much for being one of our channel members. If you're a Skull Tier member or above, you get early access to all of the sagas five days in advance of everybody else. You get to watch it, comment, all that kind of stuff before everyone else gets to see it. If you haven't got that early access, you can just become a channel member at Skull Tier Above to get that early access in the future. We've got some other great guests lined up in the future, like Midwinter Minis and Lawrence from Tabletop Tactics and Mikey from Hellstorm, etc. Um, if you've seen the other ones, you'll know how this format goes. We're going to have a chat about their life in the community, on YouTube, in Warhammer, etc. It'll probably disappear off on loads of random tangents. At the end, we're going to go into our... Fane's Unfiltered, where we uh, we get our Fane tier memberships to ask questions of our guest. And there was quite a few firing through WhatsApp earlier. I typically don't look at them. I just saw loads of them coming up. I was like, oh, there's a lot of questions for this one. Uh, so look forward to that at the end of the show. Some of them are random, some of them are serious, and then we'll be finished. And thank you so much for watching. You people are amazing. But I actually feel very lucky to welcome the amazing... So throughout the show, I'm going to call you John, but we're going to yeah. welcome you as Kirioff, because <laughs> that's your name on YouTube, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the amazing Kiros joined us today in the studio uh, for another saga. And we, I don't, do you know what? Someone asked me the other day, how did you two start talking? And I was like, I have not got a clue. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, don't I genuinely know. don't know. I think probably, <clears throat> I feel like I just saw you streaming one day. Okay. And was like, oh, this is really good. And then commented. And I think that might be the only, I think that just might be the whole. Possibly. The start of it. I don't think, I think it was just that. I just. I was almost definitely, uh, I think I was almost definitely aware of you before you were aware of me. But you've been, I think you've been doing this longer. A bit, yeah. Probably, possibly. Yeah. Um, and so, because when I first did YouTube for like the first four or five years, I wasn't doing YouTube. I was like putting a video out every two months and that's about it. Yeah. Um, whereas I think you were doing it more seriously earlier than I was. Um, and I've had this experience a few times with people like yourself, people like Midwinter, where I'm, I see the little subscriber person pop up and I'm like, <laughs> how does they... <laughs> What's the channel? I was going to say that. I think it might be it, but then obviously um, I've seen you pop up in, in live chats and stuff, and we've talked on things like WhatsApp. But I was thinking, I was like, I actually have no idea how we started talking to each other. I, th I think it was just that. I, the thing is, I don't know how we got to the point of like actually, I say knowing each other because I feel like there's a difference between like you kind of show up in someone's chat, say hi, and then, yeah. and then you, you know, go and, and maybe drop in once here and there. But I feel like there's a difference between that and like actually getting to know someone. Yes. And like it, it's, it goes from the like viewer slash streamer thing to the having someone's actual like phone number. Yeah, stage. more of an acquaintance. I don't actually know how that bit happened. No idea. I how couldn't. Phone I couldn't yeah, I don't know. I, I think I found it in the toilet on the, on the wall somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I had to flush it along with some dice, and it just <laughs> it didn't go. Um, so, so John, if you haven't already, I will do what I always do. So we'll link his socials down in the video description below, so you guys can go check out YouTube channel, Twitter page, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you've done YouTube for a while now. Yes, in one form or another. Yeah. Because yeah. I'd... I started on a completely different channel to the one that I have now. Oh, really? Yeah. I, I started doing YouTube with a friend of mine. Um, we had a web design business together that we had pretty struggled with, mostly because we were doing the thing where you have a great idea. You look at like, we were going for small to medium enterprises and going, your website's bad, we can make you a good one. And we did that and it was fine, except we found that like sole traders, tradespeople especially, not meant as any sort of indictment on, <laughs> on tradespeople. No one wanted to pay their bills. No. No one wanted to pay you. There was a lot of like, okay, Half now, half when it's done. And you'd get the half now, and then the half when it's done took months and months to chase up and never arrived. And we were getting a bit like frustrated with it. And it yeah. was at the time when suddenly you could you could actually do stuff on YouTube. Like if you did gameplay and stuff, you could get a, a network that would help you monetize it. We're like, well, we do this sort of day job together, then we game together in the evenings. 
why don't we record that as well? Okay. Because, you know, we, we get on well enough to work together and then spend free time together. So let's do that. Um, so we started a channel together, which was doing okay. And then my first daughter was born. And then I took a long break from said channel. Yeah. Because I, I was... kids. I, well, I was in hospital for with her for two months. Oh, wow. So she, she was born early and she just had not been growing. So when she was born, she like, she weighed less than a like a kilo. Oh my god! She was absolutely tiny. She would like fit in my hand, um, and of course that means that she's got to stay in hospital. They've got to make sure everything's okay. And I just wasn't really in the mood for you know having fun game time. <laughs> yeah, coming home from a hospital like every single day, just sat next to an incubator, and just, like in that time. He shifted what he was doing with the channel because he wanted to do Overwatch stuff. And I cannot play one video game for, you know, 60 hours a week because I, I'll die. Yeah. Just, I can't do that. Um, <laughs> so off the back of it, I was like, you know what? This is, this is probably the time to, to split off and try something new. Because, okay. you know, I, I'm going to be staying at home with, with, the, with the new baby. So I'll, I'll, I'll try something. I'll strike out, do something by myself which is when I actually started using my channel, which has been registered for ages, but just had no content on it. Mm -hmm. um, and I started doing gaming stuff again. And it went from gaming to realizing that I was burnt out of gaming as well. Just like fully, I think just those like couple of months really shifted everything. Yeah. Um, and also reintroduced like a coping mechanism of building Warhammer models because I'd taken quite a break from Warhammer. But so you played before the channel? I, yeah, I played in. I started in third edition. Um, oh wow! Uh, and played it for quite a while. Stopped playing because everyone moved away, and there was no one to play with. As in physically moved away. Yeah, everyone yeah. like people went to went to uni or you know got jobs or just moved out or didn't have the the money to be able to play it anymore. Which happened to a couple of people that I used to really enjoy playing with. But it was like, well, we can either pay rent or we can buy a land raider. So I'm afraid it's going to have to be rent. And it's like, okay, <laughs> terrible I, choice. Yeah. <laughs> It's something that no one should have to choose between. But, yeah. Um, so I sort of like was forced to take a break just because there wasn't anyone to actually Warhammer with. Um, so I kind of took that extended break. But then when when Eve was born, it was like I need to do something. I don't want screens. I don't want to be like playing a competitive thing. I want to. I want something that like. I can do with my hands and I'd, I'd sort of started to slowly get back into it. Yeah. But I really got back into it in like those two months because I just had those like little, like sort of hour long therapy sessions at the end of the day of where you just sit down and you get your model and you keep bashing or painting and then the world stops existing. Yeah. It's like, this is everything. This is all of the universe is right in front of me on this desk and nothing else is going on. It's incredible for that, isn't it? Yeah. Um, and so I started doing that and realized after a little while I was enjoying making models and talking to people online about Warhammer more than I was gaming. Yeah. And I didn't want to make the shift because I was like, the channel's doing okay. I don't, I don't know if, I don't know if it's, also if I start doing content on Warhammer, I'm going to burn out. Is that going to happen? Yeah. And then I sort of eased back into doing like Dawn of War 2 Let's Plays. And they, that did really well. I was like, okay, well, there's, you know, there's a, there's like a, a bridge here. That's, that's fine. <laughs> and then the primary stuff got announced, and I saw so many people arguing about whether primary should work or not, and how much they hated it, and how it was like contrary to the law and stuff. And I'm always sitting there going, I don't know that it's that bad. If I say that out loud, though, I don't know. I'm just going to record a video. Why yeah. not? Let's record a video about it. And I put that out, and the channel at the time it was like a video has got like a thousand views. That's doing pretty well. Okay. I put the primaries video out and it hit like 20,000 in the first like 24 hours. And I went, oh, okay, that's, that's very good. That's really good. What's happening? What's going on? I should talk about this more. I enjoy this more anyway. I still didn't do a full shift for like, a, I want to say maybe six months or so. I did like gameplay videos like three times a week and one Warhammer video. Oh, wow. So it's like a hybrid channel. Yeah, which doesn't work at all. No, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> Everyone on YouTube will tell you that. You shouldn't do that. Yeah, no, it was, it was, it was really dumb. Because if I have just done Warhammer, it would have exploded way more. But yeah. I was like dragging myself down because of like, oh, but what if, I, what if it doesn't work? Or what if I get burnt out? Or like, what if this is just like a flash in the pan thing and it's not sustainable? 
And in the end, I stopped doing the gaming stuff because I realized I was only playing games to make videos. Yeah. And outside of that, I just wasn't interested in them anymore. And at that point, I started doing like full on Warhammer content, which I think was probably five years, four, five years ago, something like that. Yeah. Um, so it took a while for me to actually commit, I guess. In the last four or five years, do you find you have got burnt out with Warhammer at any point? Um, or yeah. do you find it's harder to... Because I, I ask this because um, obviously we have a Warhammer channel, clearly, mm. right now. Um, and Joe and I, I don't know, I want to say 10 months ago, maybe a bit longer, maybe like a year ago, we started dabbling with a second channel, which was video gaming, because Joe and I really yeah. enjoy video games. Uh, predominantly, we're big fans of the, the Call of Duty franchise and games like Warzone. Um, now, we, we did that um, we, on and off for a bit. Then we settled into a routine, and I found I really enjoyed it until about, I reckon, three months ago. And about three months ago, I felt like I was burnt out of video games, and I stopped playing altogether. Now, I can do it because it's a secondary channel, right? So yeah. it's not my main income. So if I get burnt out, I could just stop, and I did. And I'm now at a point three months later, probably three months, maybe even longer, Three, four months later, I'm now talking to Joe about really miss playing games and I want to play games again. And I don't feel like I have any pressure with that because it's not my main source of income. But I found that within, I reckon, six to seven months, I was burnt out of video games. Yeah. Now, I've done this now full-time, full-time for two and a half years. And I don't think at any point I've classified myself as fully burnt out. I think I could have been burnt out from playing or burnt out from building or whatever. Yeah. But I feel like when one of those aspects becomes a bit stale for me i can pivot into another one of those aspects and i still enjoy myself and having fun yeah i it's i think it's it's easier to manage the sort of like warhammer slash hobby related burnout because there's just other things to pivot to mm -hmm. and there's other things in to, the same space in the same space yeah and it's it's terrible advice if you're actually trying to run a youtube channel but sometimes you do actually just need to take a week off which <laughs> is i can't i fire i i hate it and it's one of those things where it's you have the. I find that I have like the choice when it happens. I either take the week off and take like like financial damage, or I don't take the week off and take like I don't know like emotional damage. I don't know yeah. how else to put it, but like I kind of have the choice occasionally, and I've got better at going. Okay, this is going to suck. It's going to be really bad, but if I don't take this time off now, the content's going to be bad anyway. Because people are going to be able fucked. to tell yeah. that I'm not, I'm just not interested, that I just can't, I can't like, the enthusiasm isn't there. It's the same with like depressive episodes. I had a week off not that long ago because of that precise issue where I had, a, <laughs> I had an episode like sneak up on me. Um, I got like a, a diagnosis for something called trigeminal neuralgia, which is a, an issue. <laughs> yeah, it's not a great name. It's like kind of. It's very difficult to pass it on first hearing, but it's like, <laughs> effectively, it's like a nerve issue in the side of my head. Okay. So a few months ago, I walked through into my studio and I was like, that's weird. The side of my head's really like sensitive around my temple. That's really odd. I touched it and it felt like, like an electric shock almost. Oh, wow. And I was like, okay, that's, it almost felt like a, I've had like an allergic reaction to something before on the skin and it almost felt like that. So I was like, I don't know what would have touched the side of my head that I'm allergic to, but yeah. it feels like that. The next day, I was like, this hasn't gone away and it's actually starting to hurt more. This is really weird. I'm gonna try and get a doctor's appointment. They, there were no appointments available. And they were like, well, no. is it? <laughs> it was shocking, isn't it? And they're like, well, does it feel like an emergency? And I was stupid and went, no, it just feels like kind of like a very localized headache. Yeah. And they're like, well, take some painkillers and it'll be fine. On the Wednesday, I, I like woke up in the morning with just, it was like someone was stabbing me in the side of my head, behind my eye, down by my jaw, just the entire side of my head was on fire. And at that point I was like, oh, this is actually really bad. I don't know what this is, but I might be dying. So I <laughs> called again and went, oh, I called yesterday. I said it wasn't an emergency. Um, I have shooting stabbing pains in the, in the side of my face. And the, the receptionist went, oh, okay. Uh, can you get here in 20 minutes? I was like, yeah, please, that'd be nice. <laughs> Um, and so I went pretty much straight away. They figured that's what it was. It's like either there's like the sheath on the nerve has come away. And so it's just like raw or something's pressing on it. Oh, wow. And so I was like, oh God, this sucks. The, the doctor went, you need to go home and look this up. Um, go on the NHS website, looked on the NHS website. And it's like, this just is a thing that you have now. 
congratulations, it'll go into remission and it'll come back. If you're lucky, it'll go into remission for a while. If you're really unlucky, you'll have it for like a year solid. And I'm like, okay, well, I've got medication, so that's that's okay. To ease can, the pain, can, I assume. It just gets rid of it. it oh, okay. It's like a, it's, it's like a nerve, like... It like relaxes the like nerves, it dulls the signals or yeah, something. Okay. It's, it's a medication that apparently works for epilepsy, bipolar disorder, and this. Which for me, I was like, well, those are three unrelated things. I don't understand how that works, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but like, I, was, I took that, I did the full course of it, and it got rid of it within like 24 hours. Like it, so it does it, work. It, it down. It worked really well. Okay. The Wednesday night was awful. I had a migraine at the same time as it, so I was just lying in bed at like 2 a.m. like, I either need to go to the hospital or pass out, and I don't know which one is going to be better for me <laughs> at the moment. Um, but it went away. And then a, like a month after I finished that course, it started coming back again. So I went back to the doctor and was like, okay, so we're going to have to manage this through this medication. And then if it gets worse or it stops being effective, then we can look at surgery, like cutting the side of your head open and removing a blood vessel or something so it's nice. not pressing on it. So at least I have a cool scar. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I thought I dealt with it really well. I was like, I've accepted that this is an issue. I know that there's a way to fix it. I know that also there are more permanent ways to fix it. Mm -hmm. It's not going to impact me that much unless I'm like stupid and just decide not to take the medication. But why would you even do that when the option's there? Okay, this is, it's not ideal, but got it. We've got it. It's fine. Sorted. And I thought that was it. But, you know, that's not how clinical depression works. So I went, like most of me, moved forward into the next phase of, let's make sure we manage this correctly. And then the back of my brain went, you're going to be in pain for the rest of your life until you die. <laughs> it's going to be the worst thing ever. And a couple of weeks ago, I just sort of woke up one morning and went, oh, everything's trash. I hate everything. This is awful. I don't want to do anything. I don't want yeah. to get up. I don't want to model. I don't want to make videos. What's going on? I don't understand. And then, of course, you know, you spend more than 10 minutes thinking about it and go, oh, there's a lot of negative, like there's a lot of bad that's been locked behind there. Um, and that was a week where I just didn't upload because I was just very forthright and went, I don't, everything feels grey and in slow motion and there's no joy. I'm not going to record because if I record a video and I'm like, yeah, this, this looks great. No one's going to believe that. No. Everyone's going to be like, A, what's wrong with you? And B, I'm not watching this because no one wants to actually see someone fake being excited about something when they're clearly not doing great. So I took the I took the hit and went, I'm just not going to upload for a week. I'm yeah. just going to ignore it. I'm going to build some models. I'm going to make some tanks, specifically one tanks over there. I'm just going to do that. And it's going to hurt. And I'm going to look at the analytics, you know, the week after. And I'm going to have like maybe half an hour of being angry at myself. And then I'm just going to move on. because that's what I need to do. So I just had that week and I kind of, it's taken a long time to get to the point of taking the time because YouTube doesn't like you taking time off. I'm still, I still can't do it. it it's, I mean, it actively punishes you. Yeah. Like it's, it's and Lou, Lou swears at me. Yeah. She's like, you're exhausted. I'm like, I need to stream. So you're exhausted. I'm like, I need to stream. And inevitably I end up streaming. Yeah. Uh, and she gets really ar arsy with me, but I think for, for people like us in general, I, I, I feel like, um, having we, we've talked a lot anyway, and we talked this morning before we go live, uh, before we went uh, start recording. Sorry, like we're quite similar on quite a lot of things. I feel like, and for people like us, that analytics thing that you have access to is nothing but negative. Yeah, because you you fixate on it, you hyper focus on it, and and if you have a week off, any logical person in the world will tell you that when you're doing something like live content or you're uploading content you have a beat rate and you have consistency, when you break that consistency, it's going to be negative. And of course yeah. it is. It makes complete and perfect sense to the logical human that it's going to be negative. And some people can reason and say, well, I expected that because I took a week off. <laughs> yeah. My brain doesn't work that way. My brain goes, it's falling off a cliff. Oh, shit. And I'm yeah. like, and I, although I know I took, a, I took some time off, I'm like, it doesn't matter. It's falling off a cliff and it's never going to come back. <laughs> and that's, so I can't take the time off. That's exactly what I do every time. <laughs> I, I acknowledge it before I take the time. I load it up like at the end of the time taken and I say out loud, specifically for the revenue section, I guess a number and I guess on the low end in the vague hope that it's higher than that. And then I load it up. I see that the number's higher than I said. I see that all the arrows are gray apart from the one that for me really matters. And then I go, 
yeah, that was a stupid thing to do. You shouldn't have taken a week off. <laughs> it's like, it's like if you could talk to yourself like in the past, you'd probably go, "What are you doing? Like, yeah. What what is your you problem? Knew what was you happen. knew what was going to happen. Why are you annoyed about it?" But I, I I also feel like it's just if you have to take the time, it's better to do it when you can acknowledge that yeah. you need to take it. Because I've also tried the other method of just powering through. And that just makes it way worse. Well, so you did something else as well. For that particular week off, you did something else which I want to commend you for. Yeah. And I actually want to, I want to talk about it a little bit. And, and that was you became very open about it all on specifically for me, where I saw it was Twitter. Yeah. I don't know if it was posted in other places. But um, obviously, I follow you on, on Twitter. I, I refuse to call it X. I follow you on Twitter. Yeah, and, no, um, I and I saw you like almost daily updates, sometimes two or three times a day, about how you were feeling and the fact that you were taking time off. And I've always struggled to communicate, I think, to the, to the viewership and the audience in general when I'm not having a great time. Because I feel like, I don't know if you've ever felt this, and this is where I, this is where I want the conversation to go a little bit for, for a brief moment. We'll go back, by the way, we'll go back to the channel and, and how we got to and what, the sort of content he does. But as you know on these, we go off on tangents. And I think sometimes it's important. We're very pro-mental health. I think it's very important to talk about this stuff as well, in, in general. Um, and sometimes it's relevant for people that don't even know Warhammer, some of this content anyway. But um, you were very open about it on Twitter, how you felt. Yeah. And I often feel like I can't do that. And I think this is a me blocker and a me issue. Because I, I sometimes sit there and I'm like, I get to paint and build and play toy soldiers and review codexes for a living. Yeah. So I, so I, I have this, and despite what the audience tells me, and they're very supportive, I'm like, I can't have a bad day because this is my job. And yeah. a lot of those people would be like, I shovel shit for a living. Yeah. You know? So yeah. shut up and get on with it. And so I, what I do is I, I, even though that's not what's going on, I, that's how my mind processes it. I'm like, so shut up and get on with it, Liam. And I get on with it. And I'm like, everything's great, despite the fact that sometimes it's not. And actually seeing the posts and the updates going out there and you saying, I'm not doing good today. I'm having a bad day. I'm taking some time. I was like, fair play, because I struggle to put that out. Um, but actually, it's, I'm, I think because of people like you doing that, I'm getting better at going, chat, I'm having a bad day today. Yeah. Um, or, or just not even if it's chat, you're not even on live. If I'm going out on social media and going, I'm not having a good one. I'm also trying to do the converse. When I'm having a great day, I'm like, I'm having a fucking great yeah. day at the same time. It can be very easy to only tell people when things aren't going well, which yeah. is something I'm trying to get better at myself because I've kind of realized that I will <laughs> I'll tell people if things aren't going great and they're not going to get a video. I very rarely am like, this is great. I'm working on this. I can't wait for you to see it, which I think is just... It's almost like wanting the wanting the sort of highs to be as normal as possible and not draw attention to them because that's just what your day should be like. Yeah. And trying to make the yeah. lows like a, almost like a special event in a way, like a thing that shouldn't happen often or doesn't happen often. Um, and yeah, I I I just I think probably for a lot of people of like our generation, there is a thing of don't be too open about. Or like the the wisdom handed down is don't talk about this stuff, mm -hmm. and I tried that for a long time. That didn't like that worked out horribly. <laughs> so and now it's just a case of well, if I know that I'm feeling bad, I also know that if someone else said, "Don't worry, this happens," I also feel like this. That would make me feel a little bit less alone. Like one of the big things for depression is like isolation. Yeah. It, it separates you from everybody, it makes you think that no one else is having the same issues you are, which is obviously completely untrue. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, that's how I dealt with it. And like knowing on, I don't know how to phrase it, like on an intellectual level that other people have the same issue, but on an emotional level, refusing to accept that because no one wants to hear it, it's unrelatable. Why would anyone want to hear about you being miserable? You're just being a drain on everyone else. All that kind of negative. That, that's feeling. an important part as well. You yeah. often feel like, well, but by putting this out here, although I might get some support, what I'm also potentially doing is bringing other people down. Yeah. I don't want to be bringing other people down because this feels like shit. Yeah, you know, yeah. that's quite. But I, but you did put out. Is that something you've been doing for a while now, or is it just recently? Pretty much, like the where I can, if if I've. I also don't do it like every time I'm having like a really rough time of it because there are points where it, it just feels weirdly some like some depressive episodes feel more personal than others. Okay. Even though functionally they're pretty much the same. Yeah. And there have been times where I've such a dramatic way to put it, like suffered in silence, if you like. Um, because I've thought to myself, this one feels too like too bad 
to tell other people about. It's just going to make them feel rough, and I don't want anyone else to feel rough. But that's only for like really severe. Like that's when the isolation side of things really starts to like get to you. Yeah. Most of the time, it's a case of thinking, well, I feel terrible, but there's going to be other people who feel terrible. And if they feel like me, they also feel like no one else is going to feel like this. Yep. And it might mean that someone reads it and goes, oh, I didn't need to read that. I was having quite a good day. But it could also mean that someone reads that and goes, oh, yeah, I'm not the only one dealing with this. Yeah. There are other people. It's not just I'm not by myself in a corner having to cope with everything being you know, gray and colorless and soulless. There's no enjoyment of anything. But it's not just me who's got that. Even just a little bit of connection like that can make a massive difference if you're in like a really bad, like a really bad dip. Yeah. So where I feel like I can at the time, quite often I'm just like, man, depression is really, really hammering me for whatever reason today. This sucks. Luckily, I have been here before and it'll probably be all right. But just for now, I'm sorry if I don't get back to you. I'm sorry if things are a bit slow. But realistically, I know how these things go, and it's going to be a bit rough. And then things will go back to normal, and it'll yeah. be fine. And I, I always just take the view of, if someone else reads that, they may well go, oh, yeah, things are going to get back to normal. Or, yeah, it is bad, but I'm not the only one who's got it bad. And it does have that element of, <laughs> oh, what have you got to complain about kind of thing. But... <laughs> Is that not very much in our own heads, though? Because yeah. I don't think I've ever seen... I've never had, and I don't think I've ever seen, a negative response to that kind of communication. No. Where you've said, no. I'm not doing okay, or I'm too tired, or I'm exhausted, or I'm burnt out, or whatever. I've never seen someone go, boo-hoo, how Actually, bad it must be to be you. I tell a lie. I've seen that once. Oh, okay. Only once, and it was on my channel, which I thought was baffling. But someone, someone did, like, a whole reply that was just well it's all in your head we don't need to know about this and the thing that i i read it and just went that's a horrible lack of empathy <laughs> like i just I just was like take. that's just really surely you at some point have wanted to tell people what's happening so they know like just on any like human level you want sharing things is healthy yes you're like advocating firstly not sharing anything, and also suggesting that it's not a real thing you're sharing to begin with. So, like, no part of that is good. But the thing that lifted that comment for me was all the replies that are like, wow, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> well done. <laughs> we can safely ignore everything that you say from this yeah. point on. Um, and I left that comment. It did get deleted. I think the guy deleted it himself after a while, mostly because half the comments were extremely supportive, and the other half were telling this one person that they were not being particularly like good for not being in any way supportive like even if you have that view i'm kind of like of the opinion just don't you just don't need to share it yeah yeah because if it's ironic that you're telling people that like it's ironic this individual is telling you you don't need to share and what he's doing at that point is sharing yeah <laughs> there's, a, there's yeah. a degree of irony it's, to that it's yeah <laughs> it was that's the only one i've got though most okay. of the time it's just a case of people either saying that's fine like even the reassurance of Okay, we're not going to get a video this week. Okay, like yeah. that's that yeah. is something because that lifts a little bit of the pressure and means that you're not feeling as bad for you know not putting something out at that point. Yeah. Um, but every time I see a comment that it's like I also have the same problem, it's like well this was the right call to yeah. share it because that means that someone else is reminded, and because you know you know just how isolating it is. Any time you get a I'm also having this problem, that immediately makes it worth it. Yeah. Because someone else has got a connection that they might have otherwise just not felt existed. But normalizes your own feelings as well. Yeah. To a point, yeah. I think. Um, okay. So that was so so we pivoted from video games and some 40k content into <laughs> basically Warhammer content about four or five years yeah. ago. Um and I think I think it's fair to say that your content now is actually quite different to your content then. Yeah. On the whole, yeah, that that's a that's been a journey in five years in itself, isn't it? The type of content you put out. Yes, I I I used to basically just cover anything and everything that was like vaguely Warhammer related. Okay, like the the tabletop side of things, anyway. Yeah. Um, but sort of as I guess as time has gone on and I've made more videos, I've kind of come to realise there are some parts of just the game as a whole, but like just 
the games, I guess, because it's it's shifted from being just Warhammer Forty K into now AOS as well. Um, and I've also started to build up a few videos of just completely other, you know, GW not non affiliated games and stuff. Um, things like getting really deep into rules and things has become something that has fallen off dramatically. Okay. Mostly because I just don't get to play as often as I'd like to. And trying to keep up with constant changes, it kind of went from, well, I'm still going to make the army I want to make, but I would like to know just what's happening generally with what's good, what isn't, that sort of thing. And it's become fully, well, most of my hobby time is modeling and painting, yeah. mostly kit bashing. Yeah. So how good it is has become irrelevant because by the, if I were to go the route of like, I want a nice competitive army that I can play casually, but it's still good to take to an event. By the time I have finished building that army, I'm like two years out of date. So whatever it is that I was building is probably not relevant anymore. So why focus on that aspect when what I really want to do is just make a cool force that looks good on the table and is what I want as opposed to what's good. Yeah. Um, which means it's just very heavily pivoted into like just miniatures themselves. Um, which I just, I don't know, I just find that more interesting. I think even that's like a taste change thing. Whereas, all, it, I mean, it's also more evergreen, isn't it? Because a yeah. miniature's a miniature. There's yeah. always going to be that miniature. Whereas rules are, well, for 10th edition 40k, at least in about two weeks they last until they get changed again. Yeah. So, I mean, in that regard, so I, speak, I suppose for content it's better. But so, because some of your kit bashes, by the way, are absolutely phenomenal. But you also, um, when, when you were covering rules and stuff in the past, there was a phase where the channel, I think, covered. Every fucking article that came out, yeah. every piece of news that came out, every leak that came out for yeah. a while. Yeah. Um, and that's that's died off. No, I say died off, not as in like the content's <laughs> lessened, but that that type of coverage has died off at yeah. least. Um, and we talked a little bit pre-stream, but a couple of years ago, you've, you've essentially put the the complete blocker on any kind of leak-based content. Yeah. Which I find interesting. We, I've talked about leak-based content on the channel loads in the past. Um, we specifically have mentioned Valrak in, historically, because he's probably yeah. one of the biggest channels that covers leak-based content. Him and, in the UK at least, him and Allspex are probably yeah. the two biggest that cover leak-based stuff. Um, and I've said to people, like, if you want people to stop leaking, stop watching the content. But you can't deny that leak content draws a monumental amount does, of attention yeah. and views. Yeah. But you've made the decision to stop it, which I yeah. find really interesting, and it's I wanted not, to bring it up and talk about it. It's not the smart decision for channel growth. Uh, Short term, maybe not. It's it like fully, you can literally chart the point where I stopped doing it. Oh, really? Yeah, you can see where growth slowed massively. Where, uh, like, because like every, every week or every other week, there would be some sort of leak or rumor, and I would make a video and talk about it, and those videos typically did better than the other ones. Um, and... I just got to the point where there was like a flurry of a few things that just turned out to not be true that okay. I talked about. And even even with all the disclaimers of, you know, like truck truckload of salt, don't don't take this as gospel. This could happen, it might not. It's it's a rumor. That's how these things work. Nothing is like nothing is guaranteed until you see it on the shelf, sort yep. of thing. Um, even with that, I just got to a point where I didn't like the idea of like misleading people. Okay. I just fully had that moment of like, there's going to be people getting the hopes up over this. And I, if it turns out to be true, great. They've got excited for something. If it turns out not to be true. They've got excited for nothing. Yeah. And if I'm the, I don't want to be the source of someone like having that moment of, oh, finally, this thing I really want is on its way, followed by, well, that was a lie. Like, even if you give all the disclaimers, just part of me just became deeply uncomfortable with the idea of misleading people. Even though, you know, you could argue that it's not actually misleading. And I think, to be fair, I don't know that it is if you tell people that you yourself don't know. Yeah. You don't know if it's true or not. You are telling them that it's just a rumor that, by the definition of a rumor, you're not going to know until it happens or it doesn't. I just still had just like a, like a brick wall moment of, I just really don't like the idea of unintentionally i don't like the idea of lying to people intentionally or unintentionally and even though it's not lying it felt like it yeah um and that kind of coincided with like getting to know you a bit more and and um doing stuff with mikey and you know talking to people who worked really hard on videos that were constrained by ndas 
and like a set release date for when those videos could be published. And I was like, oh God, someone's just leaked all this stuff. And now a bunch of people are like, their work is just going to get nothing. <laughs> yeah. It's just nothing. It's like, there's no point releasing the video now because it's all time-based. It's all you've got to get it out as soon as the NDA drops. And what's, what's more like galling is that, and I'm not like saying this as like some sort of like attack on the quality of other people's content, but there is a, there is a difference time investment wise between a, a rumor video that is like just, you know, talking head with a few screenshots shown in. And I'm including that because that's most of my content. <laughs> so if I am having to go other people's quality, mine's also terrible. So it's fine. Um, like there's a difference between that and someone having access to all material, making a really well thought out like video breaking down key points, showing like actual proper high resolution images, like having actual, like a painted model, for instance, to show off at the end of it. There's a big difference time investment wise between the two. And the idea of just slamming a video out that took 20 minutes to record and 10 minutes to edit, getting all of the, all of those initial views because you were first, and then all the people have to wait two weeks, then putting theirs out to a trickle yep. of views compared to what it would have got if they'd have been able to do it at the right time. I, ju I just felt like, I don't know, I, ju I just didn't feel good. Like this, I, I don't know it. how else to put it. it. It just felt like, I feel like I'm taking away something here. And even if that's not necessarily the case, it's still... I would prefer my friends who are working hard to get the reward for their hard work. And the element of also like playing by the rules, I guess, like actually having that, having that kind of constraint of being under an NDA, you've got that so that Games Workshop sends you things that you are able to use for content. You are playing by their rules that they've laid out. Yeah. You could argue that you're still getting a reward because you're still getting codecs, you're still getting models, so on and so forth. But also, much though it's nice to have like free models, I guess is that's the way that most people think of it, isn't it? It's like, oh, you just get a load of free stuff. That you can't take your box of you know new like new Catachan or whatever to Tesco to pay for your food shop. You could take the money that you earn from the video that now there's no point releasing because it's going to be two weeks after all the news has dropped and no one's going to watch it. Like it, there's. I think there's this feeling of sometimes, well, if you get free stuff, you are gaining monetarily. You gain money from the video and how the video does. You could sell the stuff that you're being sent. I don't know whether that's even allowed or not, but that's, that's still not like, it's not equivalent to time spent. It's equivalent to no. working very hard and then getting nothing for it. And I don't, you know, that's happened to me when I've done stuff in the past where I've worked really hard. It's gone nowhere. And I've looked at like how a video is done and gone, this is like a week's work. No one's watched it. That's garbage. Yeah. I don't like that feeling. So why would I want that feeling to be something that's spread around to other people? You know? Um, it's absolutely probably the worst attitude to have if you're trying to make a living on YouTube. <laughs> because really, what you want to do is be super cutthroat and be like, well, yeah, I'm first, so you lot get nothing. But I just, I'm not like that. <laughs> so oh, no, I appreciate the ethical approach. If I'm honest with you, so um, if, you'll be watching this well after the fact, but we've also got Dom playing um, 40K in the studio tonight. 40K in the studio <laughs> tonight. Uh, and we've got, I, I literally opened the box in front of you. GW have, have sent us the, the Gene Studio Clock Codex and the Sisters Codex, and I'll be using the Sisters Codex. There's a reason why I've opened the box in front of you today, which is on Tuesday the 11th of June, so three days after pre-order. Because yeah. I used to open the box as soon as it would turn up. And I used to film reviews on every single codex. And I would take time to go through it. I'd have a notepad and I'd have things pop up on screen and my three favorite units and all that kind of stuff. And it got to a point where I was like, genuinely got to a point where I was like, why am I putting this effort in? Yeah. Because I would, I'd finish the video, I'd edit the video, I'd be happy with it. I'd upload it to YouTube, I'd get it ready to go at 10 o'clock in the morning. And then on Friday at lunchtime, I'd get sent a, a link to Discord or, or images on WhatsApp or, or something yeah. like that, or, or on Reddit or whatever. Like, here's all the pages. I'm like, cool. So yeah. no one needs to watch my video now. 
No yeah. one needs to know what are my three, my three favorite units because they can just read about every single unit. Yeah. And that happened like, like this was this was like literally the la end of the last edition. So this is this is after you chose to stop doing leak content. So I'm not saying it's all your fault, but, um, <laughs> but, but, you, but I but I get I get what you're saying because I literally experienced it. So now yeah. I, at the moment at least, I don't even bother doing pre-recorded content because it is a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time. And then when you go, oh, it's the Friday before and everything's been leaked. And yeah. we had this experience when ninth edition launched, it was it was it was during COVID. I said this to you before the before the, the recording. Um, where we were building our content, building our video and our, our announcement video about the whole thing and, and unboxing and all that kind of stuff. And I'm not great at making content pre-recorded. I don't have the creative flair that some people have for making pre-recorded content. It's not very good. So when I tell people that I put a lot of effort in, it doesn't necessarily mean it looks amazing. It means I'm putting a lot of effort in because I'm not very good at it. I'm great. I love live. I'm good at live. I could do live. I can't do pre-recorded very well. So I disagree with that because I've watched your pre-recorded stuff and I, I don't think that that's true. But <laughs> I think I'm shit at it. So I, so I put a lot of time and effort in to getting it ready and then ninth edition got leaked everywhere and it was about a week and a half, I think, or two weeks before the NDA was due to lift. We literally got an email from GW going, it's been leaked everywhere, you can launch your videos now. Yeah. Oh, I've not even finished editing. Yeah. Like, what, what the fuck? What do I do now? <laughs> and I spoke to other people who are like, haven't, I haven't even finished filming it, let alone editing it. I'm like, cool, good. And some people went, I'm live now. I'm like, great, they're getting all the views. Yeah. Good. I, I can't I can't compete. Yeah. It was I, it's horrible. It's I just I don't want to I just don't want to cause that <laughs> feeling. And it's, it's like as I say, it's it's horrendously like uncompetitive. Like it, technically everyone's kind of competing for the same number of, of of viewers for the same that same initial hit when you release something, but also at the same time. When it comes to our like sort of weird little niche corner of YouTube, which is increasingly feeling less and less niche. like a weird little niche, hundred <laughs> yeah. um, percent. It's like I don't think I've ever approached someone in like this space and gone, "Can we do something together?" And they've said no. No, it, it, it's, I have. It's a very <laughs> maybe I just maybe I just haven't been asking the right people. Yeah. Um, but like I, I feel like most of the time you. You know, you can talk to other channels and you can have conversations about anything and everything. And there is not there isn't really that sense of this is my this is my thing. I will allow you to be part of it for a moment, but like when it comes to when it comes to news or, or just views as a whole or the audience as a whole, it doesn't feel like that many of us are like protective of that in a way no. that is like Antisocial or refusing to interact with people. I mean, you know, it feels like like you, Mikey, and Vince. I, I I talk to all of you regularly and stuff. When I was doing like gaming stuff, that that didn't happen. That no. that, that felt like a totally different. The gaming community. industry. The gaming industry is very protective because yeah. the gaming industry literally has millions of creators trying to trying to fight for people's viewership. Yeah. I do, I do think that it's more conceivable. So I, I feel like most people that watch content on YouTube, whatever they're watching, whether it's gaming, whether it's uh, 40K, whether it's motorbikes, whatever it might be, I feel like most people that, that watch that kind of content will typically have five, six, seven channels that they watch yeah. on the whole, right? And so I guess with Warhammer uh, and, and the tabletop hobby, when there's a lot less creators, it's more conceivable that we could see ourselves as one of those channels that people would watch. Yeah. When you're talking about video gaming, where there's literally millions and millions and millions, you're like, well, there's millions. Yeah. So it's much harder to become one of those one of those watched channels, I guess. Um, but I but I also so I think that's part of it. I think that's like because we are a niche. I think it's we're like, well, I, if you like my content, you probably will like Kirios content, and if you like Kirios content, you probably will like Mikey's content. That's pretty fair to say. Yeah. And I, um, because we're such a niche, I'm like, well, actually, people may not have heard of you, and people may not have heard of Mikey, and people most definitely haven't heard of us. So I feel like that's part of what goes on. But at the same time, my attitude is, you know, I, I've said this frequently, I want people to go and watch Titans, and to watch you, and to watch Mikey, and to watch uh, Tabletop Tactics, et cetera, et cetera. And there's, you know, there's loads of channels. And I want, I want people to watch that content, and I want those people to be making good content. Yeah. Because for me personally, I'm like... If I, if everyone is if if everyone treads water, no one's got any reason to improve. Yeah. 
But if you start, I'm, you might start doing something. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I like that as a concept. And that yeah. might inspire me to do something new. And then I might do something new. And Mikey might go, oh, that's interesting. And then we, I feel like we kind of feed off of each other a little bit. So yeah. from a selfish perspective, I want people to watch other channels so I can go, we need to be better. I've got a reason now to try and improve. Yeah. That and that and there's like, there, there's quite a lot of Warhammer channels now, but it's very rare that you find a channel and then go, well, this is just that channel. Yeah. Like, even if it's just down to the personalities of the people involved, there's there's still, there's so much scope for people to be individual and still cover the same topics, but introduce things that are distinctly their own. Yes, absolutely. Um, like, I feel like of all of the channels, I've got intros now. <laughs> it's not true. Like, the one thing that I get the comment about the most in terms of, like, my videos is how almost every intro to every video is an absolute train wreck. <laughs> to the point where, I'm not going to say, like, I lean into it deliberately, but I've just stopped, like, retaking intros to videos now. Because okay. it's become a thing. Like, I, I will... It's, a, it's a, a typically carry off thing. Yeah, yeah, it's become an acknowledging it as well. I always used to cut out the fact that I would get partway through an intro, realize it was just a mess. Now I just acknowledge it's a mess on camera and then swiftly move on to whatever we're supposed to be talking about. <laughs> Which, like, that in itself, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that is something that is just... You only really get that from, currently, one place. And for good reason, it's a stupid thing to do. But, like, it's just one little element that is different to what everyone else does. And just because everyone's covering the same stuff doesn't mean you're going to get the same takes everywhere. It doesn't mean you're going to get the same focuses everywhere. You're going to get completely different personalities. You're going to get completely different interpretations of stuff. That's kind of what I don't know, makes the whole thing interesting to me is knowing that if I make a video on something and then watch you stream about like maybe the same topic or watch something that that like like Mikey or, or, or anyone else has done, the chances are I'm not going to get the same thing twice, yeah. even though the topic is going to be similar. And I think that also helps with the like the kind of more community feel yes, of I agree. just the creators as a whole. Because it is technically a competition. The channels are technically competing against yep, each 100%. other. We're all sort of vying for the same people's attention and the same people's support. But the actual the actual like what we do is different enough that it doesn't feel like I'm treading on anyone's toes and I don't no. feel like anyone's treading on mine. Well, the thing is, because of what we cover, the topic of what we cover is, I think, predominantly opinion focused. So even if you have a hard and fast black and white written rule, I might think it's a good rule and you might think it's a bad rule. And yeah. so that's still opinion focused. Um, models, whether they're pretty or not, is opinion focused. Kit bashing, that's sort of some of the content you make is very opinion focused. I think this looks really cool. I think this looks really terrible. Yeah. For whatever reason. Even law can be, which is in black and white, can, you can have an opinion on whether Angron's a good guy or a bad guy or, or whatever yes. it might be. I think because it's all opinion focused, that that fits exactly what you've just said. Yeah. So you and I can both read the same set of rules, read the same piece of law, look at the same model, and have wildly different opinions on what we think and why we think those things. Yeah. Um, whereas if you're playing Call of Duty, you're just kind of playing Call of Duty. So I think that I think that definitely leans into it. Yeah. So so do you think like so obviously you've stopped leaking, um, not personally content. <laughs> Uh, in, in like the last two three years, so is there a view? Would you like to become a preview for GW? Because because and I'll, I'll explain before before you answer. I'll explain why. Because we've been a preview for a while now. We're very yeah. lucky. We got in quite early on. Um, and I it's 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 both a curse and a blessing. And yeah. I'll explain. It's a blessing because we get content early. We work directly with GW. They give us stuff for free. I've got two new codexes and two new sets of data cards. I didn't have to pay for. Very very lucky. It's a curse because. Firstly, there's pressure to make content on that thing from yes. the audience, and I feel that pressure all the time. And secondly, uh, secondly, because uh, some people don't have the same level of ethics that you do and will continue to leak because they're making loads of money off of it. Yeah. Fair play to them, genuinely. Uh, and thirdly, um, I think the other problem is, is we've had a significant amount of abuse in the last years about being shills. And and all that kind of that kind of language that exists around yeah. people that typically I think are just a bit envious that you've got the product before them. Yes, that always that always really gets me when I, when like I see the shill comment like pop up on videos or live streams where someone is saying, "I've been looking through this thing. This part is absolute garbage, and I don't know what they're thinking." And then someone will be like, "Yeah, well, you got it for free. You're a shill." There's direct criticism there. Yeah, yeah. There's like 
if you were really shilling it, you would be like, yeah, everything in this is great. That's not what that means. Some, got, some people do do that. <laughs> some people do do that. But like the idea that you've you've received the thing, therefore anything you say about it is like tacit approval is really odd to me, especially when you have, you know, so many channels that do get the like the, like the preview stuff are just open and honest about yeah. whether they think it's good, whether they think it's bad, why they think that will actually demonstrate it through games where it's like, this, see, this just doesn't work. It's just not good. I don't know why it's in there. And it's the fact that also those channels also still have the ability to do preview stuff and they still get sent stuff, which kind of implies that Games Workshop isn't petty enough to go, this person right. doesn't like this, therefore we're just going to cut everything off. It, it kind of means that the relationship is clearly a bit more complicated than is being given credit for. There. Yeah. Um, I, I, I feel like with the way the channel is currently, I don't know how much I would actually benefit from having preview stuff. Okay. But part of what I've been doing for the last couple of months is building up content for a, a second channel, just a hobby-focused channel. Yeah. Because one of the things that comes up quite a lot on on my channel is you should show more of your hobby. And then I do, and then no one watches it because that's how YouTube works. Because um, <laughs> that's how YouTube works, yeah. exactly. You, you get the suggestion, you say, would you like to see this? Everybody says yes, you make it, you put it out, and then four people watch it. And then... Yeah. And, and One then, of which is my mum. <laughs> yeah, and then people go, why don't you make more of that? And it's like, because you didn't watch it. That's why I didn't make more of it. Um, so like, I've, I've been building up a load of content for a, a, like a, a second hobby channel, to do that because I really want to and I really enjoy making those videos, but they just don't do very well. Um, mm. Weirdly, outside of like sponsored content, which tends to do quite well, and I don't know why that is, but I think that's mostly because it's like three D printing, like companies or or like Kickstarter runs for miniatures, which there's like not not like an air of exclusivity about it, but I feel like the audience is being drawn from different areas than like yeah. the core audience for those videos. Um, for the hobby channel, having access to that stuff would be brilliant because it means I would be able to just kit bash more stuff. Yeah, I'd absolutely. be able to make more videos out of it, be able to do more interesting things with it. For the main channel, I actually don't know that it would be a big benefit, but for but for a, like the second one, having the ability to like like take one of the Primarchs, for instance, like where if if one of them was released and I was able to turn it into something really really fun, that would be a big benefit to that channel. But outside of just sticking a few, you know, pictures up in the community tab of the main channel, I don't know how much it would actually be worth it. There is also the pressure element of it, where yeah. obviously I don't know how much it, like Games Workshop goes, here's the stuff, and the video, <laughs> like where's the where's the thing you made out of the stuff we sent? I don't know whether that's an element of it or not, but I feel like I would definitely feel that pressure. And I remember, I think was it Tale of Painters, one of the guys from Tale of Painters. Um, stopped receiving stuff for a little bit. Like it kind of paused their access to the preview stuff. Yeah. Because he just felt overwhelmed. Because he was getting stuff every month. He wasn't getting through what he was sent. And it was kind of piling up. And he was like, I just don't know what to do with this now. Yeah. So and, and I've, sort of, I've emailed and said, please don't send me anything. A lot of it I is. I can't cope with it. A lot of it is perceived pressure at the moment. Yeah. So the, the relationship, I don't know how much this I'm allowed to say, but fuck it. Um, the relationship with GW is is actually quite chill. I'll give them credit. So yeah. they send us a bunch of stuff. Very rarely do they ever say, where's the video? Sometimes we've had conversations about certain things they'll send us, and they'll say, but what we want you to do with this is something like this. And there's, an, there's kind of an agreement there. And even then, they're not that bad at pushing. Yeah. That being said, the perceived pressure, depending on how much you receive, so they, they did a questionnaire not so long ago, and like, what, what do you want to receive? And it's, it would be very easy of me to have just gone, everything. Yeah. Why wouldn't I have everything? But I tried to approach it very, very honestly. At the time, for example, I turned off AOS because we weren't doing AOS. Um, I was like, we don't need AOS stuff. We've recently asked to be re-added to that list, and they, yeah. they have agreed um, because we started putting some content out there. They were like, okay, you've started putting content out there. We'll, we'll have a look. We'll, we'll look at adding you on. But um, and so now we're, we're going to be getting AOS support from AOS 4 onwards, which is, which is great. Uh, but they have never actually really it's not been a common thing where they're like, okay, here you've got your Genius Studios Codex, so what are you doing with that? Yeah. That being said, certain people out there, Josh, who was on the show, um, not the last guest, guest, three guests ago it's going to be, 
Um, he he gets a ton of stuff. He gets all the AOS models. He gets all the 40K models. He gets Warcry. He gets blah, blah, blah. And he feels a real pressure to do a painting tutorial for every single one. And yeah. he feels that pressure from two angles. He feels that pressure both from GW. They've sent me product for free. So yep. it's, my, it's my duty almost to showcase it. And he, he also says that he feels pressure from his audience. They're expecting me to put a video out. Yeah. And I'm like, but Josh, you're doing this to yourself. He's like, yeah, but... And I'm like, I totally see how you're there, though. Yeah. 100% I totally see how you're there. I, I feel like I would quickly end up like that, where it would just be a case of, I have to do something with this now, because it, it's, been, it's been sent. It's also, you know, if I've, if I've done something with the last box they released, then there's an expectation for this one yeah, to yeah, be yeah. done. And I... I it, if there was like a drop in and out, like this thing and this thing, yes, nothing else for like two months because it's going to take me that long to do something with it, that would be like the perfect Ooh. thing. But like, again, that's also a level of like micromanagement that I wouldn't expect Games Workshop to have no, well, because no. it would just be a case of, come on, like we're, we can't be managing every single person, like which specific thing they want Every single time well, we do any release would be I feel like such they, a I feel mess. Like they could do that. I feel like they could send you an email and say, um, we, are, we will soon be sending samples of the Adeptosaurus Codex. Do you want one? Yeah. Click on a Google form. Yes or no. Done. It auto populates. Yeah, that goes maybe, to the warehouse. Actually. Off it goes. Yeah. Um, I think I feel like they could do that. But I feel like the problem is they'd have to do that so far in advance. So at the moment, what happens is, is we'll get an email that says, you'll soon be receiving the following samples, right? And then a week later, the samples turn up, and then sometimes a week to two weeks later, it goes on pre-order. The following month yeah. is reasonable time frame to, from receiving information that it's coming to having it to it going up for pre-order, which is much better than they used to be, where sometimes it was like three days. Um, but I feel like if they're going to do what I've just suggested, they're going to have to do that at the point in which they're ordering product. Yes. Right? So we talking months ago, and they've already got problems with the leakers. So yeah, that's not going to yeah. make that better. Yeah, <laughs> uh, given they, uh, I think, from what I understand, they like the extra, the stuff they send out. This is, I can't remember where I heard this. It might have been from you. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'm sure it was on a stream. That now I'm thinking about it, might have been yours. Like in terms of the product that's sent out to like reviewers. It, it, it's not like taken out of no, yeah. the stock. It's, it was it's additional on. Yeah. yeah. So so um, they ask. So they ask the procurement team how many do you want to yeah. sell, and they'll a hundred thousand or whatever. And then they'll ask the content, the creator manager team, how many do you want to send out, and they'll say a thousand. Cool. So you want a hundred thousand. You want one thousand. So we're going to make a hundred and one thousand. That's yeah. what they do. Yeah. Um, so it's not taken from other people's hands. There is, I guess, there is a plus. If they always ordered enough for the creator, the creator program, they could always just put anything remainder back into stock. I guess. Yeah. Would be a benefit, but I don't know how that works internally for accounts and stuff. I wouldn't like yeah. to. I would like to dive down that rabbit hole, quite <laughs> frankly. I like being this small at the moment. The that's, that's one of the other things that is like, is it? Would it be a positive in terms of every time there's a release and it sells out immediately, being on the receiving end of a hundred angry people going, <laughs> "Well, if you didn't take oh, my mate, copy, I get that too." Yeah, and it's like. I don't think that's how that works, though. But I don't know that saying that that's not how it works is even going to help. You yeah. know, it, it kind of feels like a. I understand why you feel that way, but realistically, that's not the system. Yeah. Then do you just get met with like, okay, it's not the system. They should just sell the creator copies anyway. Like, is there any point at which yeah. that point of view is actually accepted, or is it just permanently a case of, well, it's sold out. I wanted one. This person got one for free, therefore my anger's going there. Yeah, and I, you know, one of the reasons why I put that put that statement not put that statement up, but one of the reasons why I talked about how they order it is because I've had that quite a lot. Yeah, um, but I'm also completely aware and very conscious of that that angry people on the internet are going to be angry, and it yeah. doesn't matter how much I tell them that's not how it works. They're going to be they haven't got what they wanted. They're going to be angry, and to some extent, okay, you're allowed to be angry. You haven't got what you wanted. That's fine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I've made that statement, and it, it won't help some people. Some people will still be butt hurt that I've got a copy of it, and they don't, and and so be it. And I'm, and then I also want to be like, so you've been doing this for, so you said that you you pivoted into Warhammer when Evie was born, or just after, which is what eight years ago. Yeah, and so so quite a while you've been doing this, right? Yeah. Um, to get to a point where you're eighty odd thousand subs now, I think. Yeah. The last time I looked, refusing to cross over into ninety thousand. Oh, don't. <laughs> I keep looking at the number and I'm like, 
as a this, person, it's just hovering. What is happening? As a is person it? who has literally missed every mark that's ever existed. Oh, COVID's really good for live streaming. So Liam starts at the end of COVID live stream. Like as a person who's missed every single mark, my channel growth is non-existent. But yeah, I've been doing this seven years. I've been doing it full time for two and a half years. Yeah. Like, and then they go, "Well, you're just lucky because you get one." L lucky, lucky. It's not. It's not. It's not how that works. It's lucky. Not. <laughs> There's so much work that goes into getting to yeah. a point where where you're there. So, okay. yeah, I, I I feel like I don't know what's happened over like the last, especially like the last few months, but I've I've just given up looking at like the big number on the dashboard because it just it just stays, it just oh. lingers there, and it's like that used to go up. Yeah, and it's not going up anymore. But everyone I'm not in the really audience, sure why? Everyone in my audience is. We, so we had. It's be interesting to have this conversation on camera. Actually, everyone in my audience has said, "Don't worry about it. It doesn't mean anything." Yeah, and I often, I often call subscriber numbers the vanity metric. Yeah. So it doesn't mean anything apart from the numbers big. Like that's that's kind yeah. of it, right? So if we looked at, uh, at ourselves, um, we're at thirty thousand. You're at eighty thousand, right? Roughly speaking. So in terms of channel size, wildly different. Yeah. Like wild, nearly three times the size of us in terms of channel size. And then that's kind of where that number is important stops. Yeah, it makes no difference to anything. Absolutely. It's, it's completely... But, uh, but from my perspective, the frustrating thing that I've been finding is people like sponsors, advertisers, etc. unfortunately do look at that number. Yeah. And I've been really yeah. smashing my head against a brick wall here yeah. with this one. It's... It's 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 kind of for me. I find it annoying mostly because I, whenever I get approached by a sponsor that goes solely off like the the channel size, half the time, it's not necessarily a good fit. It's just a, an agency has been told find channels of this size yeah. to advertise this thing, and so I'll get messages like I. I get a message, I get an email for Age Shadow Legends like every three months or so. And every time I send them a link to the uh, the Warlord page on the Warhammer site and say, buy me that and I'll do one ad. And then I never hear back from them. <laughs> and, then, and then they email me again like three months later. One day, I don't know, that's, that's the only way in which I do that specific ad, mostly because I just don't do mobile games or anything. Anything that appears on the channel for me has to have some sort of relevance to what the channel's about. I, like, I appreciate so that. Like, like, Warmag, for instance, I've done quite a few ad spots for them. Funnily enough, my army sat over there. It's transported in the boxes they sent me with the receptive sheets they sent me. Oh, I saw, the them, at, I saw them at Games me. Expo. Yeah they're, yeah, they're really good. I'm absolutely happy to do ad spots for them because they are relevant to the hobby. They're relevant to taking your models to places for storing them. They also actively listen to the community just flat out. When, when people wanted something that was less obtrusive on their models, they got to work and made something that was less obtrusive. Like they actually have a connection to what the channel is. Um, same thing with the 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 light company that um, I've got like ad spots for. I use their light every time I hobby yeah. because it's the one that has meant I don't get eye strain or anything. Like my eyesight's terrible. You can't see. There's a pair of glasses over there. I take them off when I'm on camera because no one else cares about this. I'll say that right away. No one else cares about reflections in glasses. No one, I've never had someone go, oh, I couldn't watch this video because I could see the monitor occasionally in your lenses. Yeah. I hate it. Like when I'm editing a video and I've, I've had to have my glasses on for something and I forget to take them off again, I sit there in Premiere Pro like, I should just redo all of that because I can see the camera. Oh, really? I don't know why it bugs me. I have no idea. It's such a small, petty thing that no one else cares about, but it's just, you know, you have those things when you're making stuff, don't you, that is, like, important to you. Yes. And no one else would notice. Yeah. it. Um, but, like, I get, I used to get quite bad eye strain when I was painting because I focus, like, my eyesight's terrible, so I have to have them on quite close, and I would end up just, like, with headaches after an hour or so, and I found that I don't get that. So I'm happy to, I'm happy to keep doing ad spots for them because... The thing they sent works really thing really well for the application they've sent it for. I keep using it. It's been there for like a year and a half now, and I've never moved it off the desk. So it's relevant. It makes sense with the actual like what the channel's about, and I use it. So I'm happy to happy to do ad spots and stuff. Outside of things related to 
models or wargaming or hobbying, generally speaking, I just don't go for. Yeah. Like, I think a couple of years ago I did Skillshare as well, but I genuinely found a couple of the courses on there useful. Yeah. For, for especially editing and filming, I found them actually useful. Um, so I was happy to do those, but there's, there's never been like an advert for like HelloFresh no, or anything. No, well, no. And it's, it's stuff that I just, if I get an email that is, it feels fully copy pasted with hello insert name here. Quite often the name is wrong, which I always like. Because that's a great We've been watching running. your channel. We've been watching your channel and we think you'd be a great fit for this mobile game that no one's ever heard of or literally everyone on the planet has heard of. Every time it's like, you, there is no relevance here. Yeah, yeah. It, there's been a selection process and you're looking for channels between like 75,000 to 100,000 subscribers. Mine falls in there. That's why you've emailed me. You haven't watched anything. You don't know what the channel's about. None of this is actually relevant to what yeah, what this is. And the sensible thing to do would be to just take the, you know, take the, the sponsorship for a video and get the money and then carry on. But again, I think it's the same like stubborn, like anti, like not wanting to do leak content anymore thing. Yeah, It's yeah. like, if it's not relevant to this, I don't want to mention it. I, I don't want to advertise something that I have no personal connection to. If I'm not interested in it, how am I supposed to tell the people who watch me that they should be yeah. interested in it? So, so I, I, I'm trying to play the long game with this one as well because um, I, I feel like, again, I feel like I'm very similar. Uh, we don't have, we've never had any ad spots actually because we're too small in the advertisers' views. Yeah. Right? Um, so typically we've done, we've shouted out for people's Kickstarters because I'm supporting friends and stuff. Uh, and we've got a bunch of affiliate links uh, that are in the bottom of all of our videos. The only reason why I have an affiliate link for any of those products is because I actually use those products. Yeah. And no other reason. So I have an, I have an affiliate for beard care products. That's the only stuff I use. I have an affiliate for secret lab chairs. I've got secret lab chairs in every studio. Yeah. Um, I've got an affiliate link for Element, but I order all my stuff for And I've done that on purpose. And so I've had a, I've, I have had some ad spot offers from companies of zero relevance to me whatsoever. Um, for a f typically for not a lot of money, I'll, I'll be open about this. Like typically for a few hundred dollars, which in the grand mm. scheme of things for an ad spot, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen transactional conversations on much, much, much bigger channels outside of the Warhammer space. A couple of hundred dollars isn't a lot of money for an ad spot read. Yeah, and um, I've seen, I've seen, I've seen ad spot reads on gaming channels in the thousands and thousands of dollars for a sixty second ad read. So it's yeah. not big, but still, nonetheless, I, I look at the product. I'm like, well, I could just pocket a few hundred dollars. Could, but there's no relevance at all yeah. to the channel. So, so the first thing I'm like, and I and I'm the same as you. I read the email and I'm like, I do that. What I do quite a lot is I reply, go, "What was your favourite video, and why? Why did you like that video specifically?" And then, funny enough, I never get a response. Yeah. Um. But the, the other thing, I, I well, the thing that always sits in my mind is I do review content. We review codexes, we review product. I talk about the game. I review the game. I talk about how I feel the game is going, uh, all that kind of stuff. And I feel like if I lose my integrity, because I set out to Rage Shadow Legends and be like, yeah, cool, whatever, I'll take the money, then perhaps that devalues the rest of my content. And I think a lot of people are probably like, nah, you're just, you're just making money, Liam. Of course you are. Yeah. But I'm like, no, but in my <laughs> yeah. mind, I'm like, no, but it devalues it because I'm not being honest because I would never fucking play Rage Shadow Legends because it looks shit. So, so I this is the thing. I have actively encouraged other people I know to take things <laughs> that I have not taken. It's like, well, yeah, I mean, why, why would you not take that? You, you should. Yeah. You're, you're like your time is is worth your time is worth it. Yeah, you, yeah. You you put all of your time and effort into making this content. You deserve to be paid for it. If doing an ad will help with that, then you should absolutely do it. But then I will get you know the same you know a similar offer or the same company approaching me and be like, yeah, but that doesn't fit the channel. I don't really <laughs> and it's like it's like hypocritical, but in a stupid way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's absolutely. Like, it, it's not even. If it was the other way around, it would be like evil hypocritical. I'll take all the ads. You shouldn't do that, but I definitely will. Instead, it's like, no, dude, you should absolutely. Yeah. I'm not going to. But you should. No, I'm, like, not, I'm not going to do it because of my integrity, well, but you. <laughs> it's, yeah. Like, I, I had a full conversation with someone who like watches the channel and they, their channel's bigger than mine. They, they, like, they said they caved and did Raid Shadow Legends. And then they just felt like they shouldn't have done it because yeah. it, it it didn't it didn't fit and they didn't feel like they felt that it made the video worse. And I was like, well, 
has it helped? Well, yeah, obviously, because it's more money. Funnily enough, most people, it helps. I, of course it helps. I was like, well, that's all there is to it then. Yeah. And they're like, but you won't take it. And I'm like, yeah, but that's because I don't like it. Like, I think there's also the thing of, of it kind of is probably coming across as being like a bit like morally superior, but it's not necessarily like moral superiority. It's more just, I think it is from that same place of, I don't want to recommend something that I don't use. I, yeah. don't, I don't want to tell people who are listening to me, you should do this if I'm not going to do it. And the reality of it is I'm not going to play 99% of mobile games. So I'm not going to tell other people to do it. That being said, I've now got the, the title for the video. That's I'll play Rage Shadow Legends for a Warlord Titan. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing. When, I, when I've emailed them, I like it was... I've, he was during a, a stream, during one of the like preview streams that GW does, and I was like re like streaming it myself as well. And we'd got onto the topic of ad spots and stuff. And I I just flat out was like, if I got a if I got a warlord, you lot would be okay with that, right? If I well, <laughs> it would be funny. It would at least be funny in that case. Like if it's just for the sake of doing the ad spot for doing an ad spot. Yeah. I, I don't want to do that because I don't want to play the game and I'm not going to play the game. But I feel like an ad spot that opened with, I said I would never do an ad for Raid Shadow Legends, but then they bought me this Warlord, yeah. and there's a fully built Warlord on the table next to me. I feel like there's enough irony in there, and there's enough humor that it goes from being, you've abandoned your, frankly, pointless principle, and you've made a joke out of it. Like That becomes slightly more acceptable. 100%, absolutely. But at the same time, if I just did an ad for Raid Shadow Legends, I'm 99% sure the viewers would, as a whole, just go, so? Yeah, cool. They wouldn't care. They yeah. absolutely wouldn't care. I think the only people <laughs> that would get really narky are the ones that are just a bit jealous that you've made some money out of it. That's kind of about it, really. And even then, like, I feel like we've both got quite lucky in terms of the kind of communities that we've built up. That I don't really think that sort of person exists. On my... <laughs> but Luce, Luce has got to a point where she's almost banned me from using the word lucky. He's like, he's not lucky. I think, I think I, honestly, I believe this can be applied to yourself as well. But she continues, she says to me, she says, it's not lucky. We don't have this lifestyle because we're lucky. It's because yeah. you work fucking hard all the time. Um, we, you don't have the community you have because you're lucky. It's because you've built that community. Yeah, that's And you fair. attract those kinds of people. And I'm like, because I, I'm, I'm I use the word lucky all the time. She's like, it's not lucky. It's not lucky. You, it, you earn it. You need to own it because you earn it. I'm like, I can't do that. In a, in a way, it's sort of like... <laughs> It's like almost uncomfortable to to acknowledge that it might be down to things that you've done. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. It's like, oh, but if if I say that if I say that I've managed to get like a really good group of people around me, that implies that I'm doing something right, and that can't be true. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's just luck. <laughs> it's, all the people around you will be like, yeah, that's because what you did created that. Yeah, but inwardly, it's like. I know that doesn't sound right. <laughs> that doesn't. That can't be true, can it? Surely not. Surely yeah. there's just an element of cosmically this just happened, and I'm cool with it. But I'm not sure why. It's way easier to treat it that way than yeah. to go. Um, maybe I'm doing something right with this because <laughs> that you know that means that actually you know you're taking credit for something, and that's not allowed. Which we're, we're, we're bad at doing. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. not. That's not on. <laughs> we'll talk about that a little bit more just after the break. Okay, so, right, you, the break that you don't know existed has happened. Chat, all right. <laughs> I, the other thing I do, right, is I always call them chat, and they're yeah. not chat anymore, because I'm so used to streaming. But I, I went into calling my lot a gang. Oh? I'm not really sure why. No? It, it just sort of started to slip out. You're in the middle of one, yeah. Yeah. It's like your own version of the Peaky Blinders. <laughs> it's not a very good version. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so I want to pick up on something that you said just before we stopped for our little break, at least, um, about uh, accepting that... If you've built a good community or something like that, then it's based on, on, or you sort of feel like you're praising yourself. Yeah, this is something that we touched on quite a lot with with War Hipster, um, and I wanna, I, I know that this is something that's actually quite common, and so I'm trying to talk about it more openly with people in general, and that's the fact that I think a lot of creators in 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 general are are quite self deprecating. Like they they quite often don't. There are some egos out there that exist. Yeah, uh, and I'll all, sometimes I sit in awe of those people in a creator space 
who are prepared to put their face on fucking everything, who are, do you know what, do you know what, you, you know what I'm yeah. saying there, right? I am, say for example, like Instagram, let's take Instagram as an example. Let's step away from YouTube for a brief moment because it's this, this point's kind of irrelevant for YouTube. I don't like my own face. Right? <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, I'm right. When I say I'm right with you, I mean I feel the same thing. Not I also don't, don't like, like my face. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so like, for, for things like Instagram, I can't, I can't be the person or the thing in the photos all the time. And I've been told that Instagram only really works if every third to sixth post or something like that is one of yourself so people yeah. know who you are as a creator. And I can't do that because I hate my own face. But I also, like when Lou says, it's not luck, you've built the community. I'm like, no, that's, I don't, I'm not yeah. comfortable with that. That doesn't sit right with me. Um, I, I, sometimes I think it's a benefit that I'm not that way around. Sometimes I think it's a benefit that um, I don't assume it's all me and it's all, it's more me all the time. Because I think that sometimes means I work harder or I, you know, I, I try and make more improvements or whatever and, and believe that the content or the quality of the content potentially is what's bringing people in. Yeah. But she's like, no, sometimes it is you being you. Um, and I, and I, I, we've spoke quite a lot. You've obviously already mentioned things like the fact that you suffer with depression and stuff. Yeah. Thankfully, at least as far as I'm aware, I haven't ever had that problem, um, touch wood so far. Never say never, of course. Um, but do you find that something you do? Do you, do you find yourself deprecate quite a lot or <laughs> yeah. so I've criticized I'm, too I'm much? really bad for it. Oh, really? I, I get told off a lot. Um, <laughs> like, I... Things like like painting painting miniatures, even even though it's a very like it's borderline therapy, sitting down and painting a model from start to end. Yeah. So on the rare occasion that I actually do paint it from start to end and don't get distracted by something totally different, um, but I will finish it. I will look at it, and it could be the best thing I've ever painted, and I will go, yeah, that's okay. And then I will like because because I like sharing it. I'll like put it on Twitter. I'm like I'm pretty happy with this, and I will immediately get friends messaging and going, "What do you mean you're pretty happy with it? What are you talking about? It's yeah. really good." And I'm like, "It's not though, is it?" It's like, "No, it." Okay, you've done this like in the last four things you've painted. You've gone, "Yeah, it's fine." When actually it's quite good, and yeah. I'll be like, "Yeah, but it's not. It's not that good, is it?" It's just a golden get demon that. winning good. <laughs> I, get, I get I get like frequently told off because of you know I. I Everything is undersold. Yeah. Not necessarily intentionally. Like I'll I also like couch everything in kind of for me or in my opinion, or like I think this might be the best like thing that I've done. Whilst there's like it might be accurate, but there's also like a kind of undercurrent of I'm saying it's the best thing I've done because clearly it's nowhere near as good as what most other people can do, whether that's true or not. Um, same thing with like kit bashing. Like I really like the the Mega Gargant army that I made. That's just all all like horrible like nightmare creatures. I think that's the best army I've put together. But I will present it as these are the dumb models that I built, and get told off because it's like, what do you mean? Well, they are kind of silly. Yes, but why are you introducing that as the primary thing? It's not, look at these things I made out of my imagination and took multiple kits and put them together. It's not like, here are the things I kit bashed that took a lot of work. It's, these are stupid and too big. Yeah. It's like, but that's not a descriptor of it. That's you putting down the thing that you did. And I don't know why you've done that because I actually think they're quite cool. Like, I've had that off people and it's just very hard. I think it's a habit you get into. Do, do you know why you do it? Self-loathing? No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I, I think a lot of it is just down to the idea of if I undersell it, then probably if the response to it is bad, I've set my expectations. I've set my expectations. Yeah. I, if I introduce this this thing that, like, if you look at it next to other models that I've painted, is objectively better than all of them. If I say, I mean, it's okay for me, then if someone says, well, you, actually, you've missed this bit here. Then what would be a like a quite scathing thing that isn't scathing at all but feels scathing at the time becomes well yeah I expected that yes but the things I apply it to literally everything I do from videos to well, models but, to but this is the world we live in where what we essentially do is we put what is our hobby and passion out there for the world yeah. to critique because whether we're doing a talking heads video or whether we because because I very much enjoy making content and videos, whether we're painting a model and posting it, whether we're doing a battle report, whether we're making a conversion, what we do, which a lot of people don't do, is we go, there you go, internet. Yeah. 
that's what <laughs> yeah. I've done because I'm because I'm a creator. Is what we do, and then and then inevitably, we really. Uh, I think if if we're all on it, what we really, really, really want is everybody to go. That's phenomenal. I love it. And then and then everyone else sees it, and it gathers momentum to a point. Although that sets its in a minute or on time, that sets its own pressure for the next time you do it. But <laughs> yeah. but what, what inevitably happens is you will get some people that because the internet is full of horrible fucking assholes. It just is. Someone will go, that's awful, that's shit, I don't like your colour, I don't like your, your content's bad, your opinion's bad, your takes are bad, you, you know, you don't use enough top-down camera. Who's the fat guy with the beard? Oh, that's me. Uh, <laughs> you know, like, that hap- it happens. And so yeah. I think, because I'm, I'm quite self-deprecating in general, and I'll come off of a stream and be like, mm, I don't think it was that good. And Kyle and Joe will be like, that was great, what are you talking about? Uh, I'm not sure. This is the thing that, like, I don't know, makes me, makes me feel like better about the fact that I have really struggled to actually commit to streaming that you say that and you've said that in your streams that you you know you'll start a stream thinking it's going badly or you'll finish a stream and think it's gone badly when actually it's gone really well my main obstacle when it comes to streaming is unless there is a like like a hard premise for it so like if it's like a warhammer reveal stream that's great for me because I know exactly what I'm going to do yeah. and I know how it's going to go and I know that this amount of time is accounted for. And then afterwards, we'll talk a bit more for another half an hour or so. And then I can stop. And then once I've stopped, I can spend the next hour telling myself how garbage that was and how it's amazing that more than two people watched it. And why do people even watch me anyway? And then I'll, you know, wake up the next day and suddenly go, actually, that was okay. The build up to doing that without like the hard premise, the thing that we know we're going to do. I talk myself out of it every single time. Like, yeah. technically, I'm supposed to stream three times a week. I think I've streamed three times in three months because that is a mental, like, hurdle that I still have not got over. The only, I mean, it's the only one that I've done outside of, like, streaming a reveal thing was after I was first diagnosed with the neuralgia. And that was because I didn't know how to put that in a video, but felt like people needed to know why things were super rough. Yeah. I was like, if I, I feel like I just need to talk about it, but I don't know if I'm going to be able to get an edited video out because I'm going to record it, then I'm going to try and edit it, and then I'm going to go, no one cares about this, don't put it out. But I do feel like I need to say something about it, so what do I do? So I, I streamed talking about that, just answering questions and sort of, that was the right way to do it because it meant that that stayed up and people got updated and I was able to get a bit of it like off my chest and just yeah, be yeah. open about it. But even that was like, as the, as the like starting soon screen was on, like, and if I just stopped it now, it would look like the connection had dropped. and That would be, that would be okay, right? Oh no, but if I do that, no, because it, it would freeze if the connection dropped. Do I just I kick the router? What do I do? And then I, the screen went off and I actually had to do it. And it yeah. was fine, funnily enough. It all went okay. But that whole element of it. There's also, I was so used to doing like edited stuff. There's also a fear of what if I say something stupid? Oh, it's, Which, what, it's my content. Well, this is the thing. I, do, I say stupid stuff in the videos and then I leave it in. <laughs> So it's like, yeah, but you have the choice. That's yeah. You that have is, the control over it. Then I think that's a big part of it. It's like I could get rid of this really dumb moment where I've forgotten what something's called and then Google it, and it's funnier to put in the fact that I've Googled it. But if it's if it's if it's live, even though it's never anything of consequence, it's never anything important, and it never would be anyway because you know I'm not going to just dive into something that I have no idea what I'm talking about unless it's something inconsequential and would be funny to yeah, yeah talk about. But there's, there's that kind of a buildup of, okay, if you do go live, these are the things that could go wrong. If they do go wrong, how are you going to recover? If you don't have a proper premise for it anyway, what's the point in even trying to talk about this stuff to begin with? And if you do do it, the chances are it's going to be a mess and you have to stop early. And that all happens within about 10 minutes of thinking, I should start streaming. And then about two hours later, having done something totally different, not gone live, I'm like, it probably would have been okay. <laughs> and then we just rinse and repeat and I've done that for like months on end yeah. like that's that is an ongoing conversation uh in therapy which is like I think we've I think we've found a, a unique like form of of like self-hate going on here that we should probably address and work on because that's a very odd thing to do um not that she's phrased it like that I don't think they're allowed to say that you're very <laughs> odd but like <laughs> there's definitely an element of like 
I don't know. It, it's actually very helpful when you say like, I don't think that this, I'm not in the mood to do this or like saying that you're like super tired and you didn't want to go live, but actually it helped to do so. Um, because so that, that in a way is kind of like made me go, it's once again, with so many things like this, it's not just you. Yeah. So, so often, so often, um, I say so often, quite often, um, I, I'll be tired, fatigued, weary. There's a reason for that, which we'll go on to in just a moment. Um, because I think it's something that you've said you suffer with as well. Uh, and actually, more often than not, when I when I feel like I don't want to stream, I come off the stream and I think, I'm glad I did that. And I feel more oddly more energized and happy and it's all gone quite well. There are occasions that doesn't happen. Last night was a was a case in point. Um so I I've started hobby streaming on Mondays at 7 30. Yeah. Um just to just because I want to do some hobby. I, I was finding that I, I was running a hobby channel. Or a channel based on Warhammer, and I wasn't doing any Warhammer apart from playing yeah. up there. And everything that we got through the door went to Joe, and he did because he builds and paints for us, and he's significantly faster than I am. I'm terribly slow at painting. I'm terribly slow at doing anything hobby related. What I actually found was I really missed it. So I had a conversation with Luce, and we built the Monday stream at seven thirty to 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 do hobbying. And she literally yeah. sits there at her desk and hobbies as well. Granted, it's she's sewing or knitting or something, but she's doing her own hobby. Yeah. And we are, and we were sitting there having conversations. So I put the camera on. Now, I would classify last night's stream as an utter disaster for me because we had an average of less than 100 people, which is, doesn't happen for us. Yeah. Uh, we had um, monetization was terrible, super chats were low, memberships were low. And actually, in terms of a stream, it was a disaster. But I was like, but I sat and I did some hobby. And I kind of felt better for it. Yeah. Now, everything in the YouTube analytics would tell me after last night's stream, don't do that again. It's yep. a fucking terrible idea. Yeah. On Monday, I should probably go live again <laughs> for the hobby stream. Because in that, so, so I, I found that in two ways, it can benefit me. Sometimes it's because it goes really well and I feel energized. Sometimes it's just because it's something that I wanted to do anyway. And yeah. so I feel better. But there are occasions on stream, so I, I know how you feel sometimes. There are occasions on stream where you're like, numbers are bad, the audience is dead, the conversation is not moving, and I'm live right now. Yeah. How the fuck do I save this? Yeah, that's that's a stress that I both kind of love and is <laughs> awful at the same time. Yeah. So I think there's also an element as well of like the like we've mentioned consistency already and like having a schedule and, and people knowing when you're when you're live and when videos are uploaded and stuff. There's no consistency to my streaming, so things like gifted memberships and stuff are quite rare because I don't do it. Yeah, like it, the, it's almost like there's an investment there of you're being rewarded not just for the time of that like of that stream but also because you have demonstrated that you are going to continue streaming and like that aspect of the channel is a constant whereas if it's not a constant there's there's no real incentive to do it which also means there's an additional hurdle of well if I stream I could be making videos which I know will be monetized through ad revenue which is not good but it's still like it's still something whereas Unless I commit to doing this schedule of streaming, the like the take up on it is going to be bad to start with, most likely. So there's that additional thing of if I do overcome all of like the anxiety and worry, is it going to be totally pointless at the end of it? Because there's been no interaction. Oh, there's yeah. been no like. It's there's so many like it's like multi levels of getting in your own head. Yeah, and then by the time you get to the end of it. It just seems like an absolute disastrous idea. Don't do it. And then think, <laughs> you should have just done it. Well, <laughs> that's the thing with streaming is streaming is very much, it's almost like the instant pat on the head. It's the instant praise. Yeah. Because if you get it right and you do well and you and you are entertaining and you're making people laugh and chat's moving and gifters are coming in and super chats are going, you're like, I'm being patted on the head. Good boy, Liam. Well done. You're putting on a good show. Right? Yeah. That happens. And so when their audience is dead, for whatever, and it could be a number of reasons, it could be external factors. Um, there was a number of channels that were live last night that sometimes aren't normally live when I'm live. That could be an ex like an yeah. external factor. But in my mind, I'm, I'm the way my mind is, is I'm like, I put on a bad show. So it's my fault because yeah. I didn't get the pat on the head. It's my fault that I didn't do a good job. I didn't put on a great yeah. show. So I totally get where you're coming from. And, and my, the way my mind works is I both absolutely love the instant gratification where I can come off of a show and go, I don't need to. So the prop I find, conversely to you, if I make a piece of pre-recorded content, if I make a 20-minute video or a half an hour video, or if I when I edit these podcasts, I'm like, I have no idea how much money they're gonna make. Yeah. No idea at all. And I hate that. And sometimes it takes weeks and weeks and weeks before you go, okay, it did all right. 
I, that yeah. my mind struggles that massively. If I come off of a stream, we did a hundred gifted memberships and a hundred pounds super chats. I'm like, I don't know how much money that video made immediately. Yeah, and anything else ad revenue wise is just a bonus. Yeah. So that's that's like how I kind of logic like yeah. how I play that logic out in my mind. It's like I know how much money that made. So if I do a terrible stream, my mind's already going. I need to add in another show this week, or or I need to do something to make yeah. up the difference. And I can act on it immediately, yeah. rather than having to wax on it two, three months later. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is, that, like, you can get used to all of the, uh, like the, the bad side of doing the pre-recorded stuff and knowing that you're not sure how it's going to do. It's not actually any different to knowing whether the stream's going to go well. No, exactly. It's, it's the same. It's no different. It's the same thing. <laughs> exactly. But for some reason, there's like you know, the the the, the mind's gone. Right, we've put a gate in that brick wall, so that's absolutely fine. But this one, it's too tall, and there's no way through it. And no. <laughs> I'm not going to explain why you keep doing this to yourself, but I'm definitely going to keep doing it. And it's like, oh, what? Again, every single time it's the same pan. And it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, so you, I mean, you've, you've said that the word, there's, there's a word you've used quite a lot about your mind and your brain. And um, I mean, I'm the same. And um, what I want to touch on now is you've you've and you're fiddling, right? I, yes, uh, it's fine. <laughs> I want, I, like I said, I want to bring these things up on purpose because I want to normalise this kind of stuff because I think everyone, to some point, fiddles or fidgets or whatever. Uh, but you said you said to me earlier that you're waiting for an appointment or a diagnosis or, or yes. something. I, I'm like at the at the beginning stages of trying to find out if there's trying to find out. I guess formalising the idea of there being some ADHD yeah. going on and and. Um, there's, there's like other things that aren't like sitting quite right. It feels very weird to be talking about this, like in your late thirties, but, um, I feel like there's for like our generation, it's like part way through, it's as though part way through us realizing that there are these issues, all the support is there for our kids to, to be tested, right. to be, to be examined, to be seen, to, to work out what's going on there. There's a, a huge amount of acceptance with things like um, like having like sensory issues, whether there's like a sensitivity to sound. Like my my first my first daughter Eve, she has an issue where if things are too loud, she she just gets really upset. It just becomes overwhelming. So she's got a pair of like earmuffs that she's got. So if she goes to the cinema, she'll take those with her because if it's just if it's just too loud, it's like it becomes completely overwhelming for her. Mm -hmm. And that's like that's something where straight away we realized that was the case. We went, okay, we'll get a pair of ear, like ear protectors. She'll be good. That'll fix it. No problem. And it's worked super well. After we did that, I, it was like probably like six months after we bought those for her. I had a moment where I was walking around Tesco doing the shopping and I just suddenly thought, why do I wear headphones every time I go out in public? <laughs> It's weird, isn't it? Yeah. I've never thought about that for years. Anytime I walk somewhere, anytime I'm by myself, like, you know, doing the food shop or whatever, if I'm going to an event and I've had to park, you know, 10 minutes away, I have my earphones in. How oh, often wow. do I have them on is the other question. If it's somewhere I'm familiar with, I'm listening to a podcast, usually a comedy one, which is usually a bad idea because then you start laughing in the frozen <laughs> like island. Like a being weird, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But like, <laughs> I, I went to a thing not that long ago for uh, Fallout. I think it was Wasteland Warfare. They mm -hmm. did the launch event for um, at the Honest Wargamer studio. Yeah. And I had to park like 10 minutes away. There wasn't any parking that close to it. And I, I walked there. I had my headphones in. But I realized part way through that journey, oh, yeah, if I don't know where I'm going, I don't have any sound. I just have them in. Everything around me gets a, quite a lot quieter. It well, reduces the noise the, thing, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. It reduces the chance of people like talking to you because you've got headphones in. Not that, that really happens all that often anyway, but it's still like a built in, like not anxiety, but just I would prefer not to be bothered whilst I'm out and about. If I've got headphones in, there's less chance of that happening. And it was just that realization of, oh, so I've been I've been doing exactly what I did for my kid this whole time. Yeah. Not once did I think, do you have an issue with like sensitivity to sound? And it was that realization of, oh, yeah, I have. I've always had that. Like, I remove myself from situations that are too loud. If I can't have headphones in, if I'm at an event, there will be a point where I need to step outside for a moment mm -hmm. because there's too much going on and I get overstimulated. Um, things like, things like even like, like touch being an issue, 
things like that where again she likes like playing rough and sort of jumping all over you but she will have a point where she'll be like i get off me <laughs> you know so you don't 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 pick me up daughter's not wife minute. right yes yes <laughs> luckily yeah um <laughs> But I've realized with, with like having two kids, with the age they are, like eight and six, they like to climb all over me. And it was only when they arrived that I realized that there will be a point where suddenly there, there's, no, there's no in-between, there's no build-up, there is a switch that flips, and I have to be left alone right now. Mm -hmm. It's like everything goes hot and stressy and tense, and I start to feel like everything is like closing in. And I've, it's got to the point now where, to be fair to them, they're both like, I've never made any attempt to hide issues with anxiety or depression That's because good. there's, there is no point in them thinking that there is nothing wrong if there is, because I'd much rather they grow up knowing that sometimes I'm going to be really, as they put it, really sad for no reason. And I've said that I say no reason, it's because it's just like having a bruise. Or, you know, there's there's a kid in your class who who broke their arm. It's the same as that. It's just it's just an illness, but it just makes you very sad sometimes. And so there will be moments where they will just come over and be like, Are you feeling sad today? And I'm like, Yeah, I am. But I'll be okay tomorrow. Just it'll be fine. And they'll accept that. I'll get a hug, they'll wander off. But that has kind of also enabled the fact that if they're like climbing all over me and the and the switch flips and I'm like, I've you've gotta you've gotta stop, I can just go. You need to get off right now. And they both go, okay. And they get up and they move away from me. And I can just stand up and go, thank you. That's very nice. What do you want to watch? Put something on for them on the telly. Walk into the dining room out of the living room. Sit down and go, oh, okay. Right. <laughs> Let's just, we need to calm. We need to be calm. We need yeah. to be quiet. We need to settle. And it's like without, I don't know that without them, I would have picked up on a lot of the stuff that just has been a thing the whole time. But there's been no reason to think about it or focus on it. There's been no reason to examine it or try and work out why it's happening. Instead, it's all through the lens of your kid has this has this thing. You want to make sure that they are okay. So you go what you need, like you go through what you need to to make them okay, and then afterwards go. Oh, I wonder if they got that from me because that's literally what I've been doing this whole time. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the exact <laughs> that's same. Interesting. That's the exact same Jelly Loose and I have had. So our, ours. Typically, actually, I started uh, when COVID hit and lockdown happened. Yeah. Um, and I think that, you know, I think a lot of people learn a lot of stuff about themselves in COVID because, you know, what happened is we all got chucked in a house and when you stay there, you can't go anywhere. You can't do anything. I it was the right call to not become a teacher. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm yeah. terrible at being a teacher. So, um, so, so Lisa, you know, I've, I spoke about this on a stream before, but for those who haven't seen it, because sometimes with streams, people don't watch all of it and they miss some, some things I've spoken about. But um, Lucy had talked about home educating our eldest, who was at, who was at school at the time. Our youngest wasn't yet in school for, for ages. And I, I need to add a quick caveat. My parents are wonderful humans, and I love them dearly. They're amazing. But they're very old-fashioned people. Yeah. And I was brought up in quite an old-fashioned way. Um, and so, mum, uh, so Lucy would be like, I, I, want to, I think James needs to be home educated. I don't think he's coping in school. And I was like, wrongly now, I, this is, we're talking start of COVID. I was like, no. He can fucking go to school and he can learn to concentrate. He's got to learn that because yeah. because the working world says you wear a uniform, you go to work when you're told to go to work, you take your lunch break when you're told to take your lunch break, and you sit there and you concentrate and you do whatever your job is, right? Which is very ironic considering my current career, um, where I just choose what I do whenever I want. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I was like, I was like, no, I went to school. He can go to school. He can learn to conform. Yeah. It was very much my attitude, and it it was it was just the way I was brought up, and I was essentially regurgitating that. So then COVID hit, right? And the government say, all your kids are going home. I'm like, right, okay. So I, I, I didn't go off oh, fuck. So what I said was, I said to Luce, I said, well, you know what? He's got to come home now. And they're going to say, they've, they've told us that he's going to learn at home. You want to home educate. So you've got a chance now, really. Yeah. Go for it. Give it a go. And if you love it and he loves it and you're both doing well and you're enjoying it, then we'll have a serious conversation when the schools reopen as to whether we want to keep doing this or whether we want to send him back into school. She's like, are you serious? I was like, yeah, absolutely. We, we've got a free try. Yeah. So, so we did. So, um, so she started home educating. And what that means was, uh, and obviously my youngest has now got to an age where over the course of the last few years, so she's now educating him as well. What that means is my kids are at home all the fucking time. 
which is a blessing and a curse. Uh, from a channel's perspective, to start with, before we had this space, an absolute curse. Yeah. Trying to film content or record content with two kids in the house all the time is a nightmare. The blessing has been the kids are home all the time. So we get to see literally every behaviour. Yeah. We get to see all the interactions with other children in the park because we socialise them heavily. Yeah. Almost every day there is something social that they do on purpose because because they're not in a school. Yeah. We want to make sure we keep socialising them. Um, so we get to see their interactions directly with the children rather than through the eyes of a, of a dinner lady or, or, a, um, or a teacher or whatever. Um, we get to see their interactions at home. We get to see the highs, the lows. We get to see how they're coping when they're learning. We get to see how... We get to see literally everything. Yeah. And what that's been amazing because we'd already been approached by the school before COVID that autism might be a thing and they think that he might be high functioning. Um, that we carried on talking to... Um, to not specialists, what are they called? Oh, which loose calls, calls them. But we kept on talking to uh, prof- healthcare professionals yeah. actually after the fact. Um, and having them home all the time and seeing every single interaction, the amount of times I've gone, oh shit, <laughs> yeah. that, that was me. And, and then what I really learned was what I, learned, what I learned over the course of the last few years is I'd spent most of my adult life doing a significant amount of, of what's known as masking. Of yeah. hiding the aid typically for me is the ADHD. The thing I, I I mean, I'm definitely on the spectrum somewhere. I think most people are are on the spectrum somewhere. Some people are just on, some people are well on. Yeah. I think most people can't. I think if most people were honest, they wouldn't be able to say, no, I'm not on it at all. I think if you look at it, there's 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 little traits you go, I'm one foot on, but I'm on, right? Yeah. The biggest thing that I suffer with is ADHD. Um, and the the fidget in the fiddling is is masking the fact that I I need to do something, I need to get up and move or whatever. And I and I, do you know what? Especially from a channel perspective. It was so liberating to go, okay, it, it is, it's, it's a me issue, but it's not my fault, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I have an answer as to why this is happening now. And so if it means I, I don't achieve something or I don't get something done, rather than going, and the, my eldest was terrible for this at school, rather than going, I failed. Yeah. Which is horrific. And I, when my... When my uh, when my nine year old eight nine year old son was saying I failed I'm a failure I'm like you're eight yeah how can you be a failure at eight <laughs> that's not how that works and then I'm like oh, fuck I go through that as well yeah that's mad but it's not actually my fault there's a reason as to why this has happened and then now I understand the reason I find it easier to manage I find it easier to go I need a break I need to walk away. I just need to accept the fact that the days are right off. We spoke about this before the yeah. stream as well. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that what's been interesting is as I the reason why I asked you about it is because as I've talked about it on streaming, the amount of people that have said, I'm so glad you're talking about this and normalizing it. And I think it's important that we normalize it. Yeah. Because we spoke about it with Josh as well. I know it's something you've said you've you've suffered with or felt you've suffered with. I've not gone down the route of going official diagnosis, you have. Um, I just want more people to be aware of the fact that you know what? I think yeah. a lot of people are in that bracket. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's less about like having something to be done about it and more just, I guess, more just like confirmation. I find it easier to cope with something if I know that it's real, which sounds, probably sounds a bit weird, but like for a long time, the assumption when it came to the depression side of things, that started when I was quite young, um, depression and anxiety both kind of manifested when I was in my late teens. So it was like everyone else is at high school being, as I felt at the time, normal. And then I, for a while, I didn't go to school on a Thursday because I would get so anxious that I would end up like making myself ill. Yeah. And it was entirely because I had one bad Thursday. And then from that point on, Thursdays, no good. Just Make couldn't it cope with it. Yeah. Um, and my parents' solution, one of them was to just say, well, you need to just get over it. The other one was to actually try and get me into therapy, which was incredibly forward thinking of my mum, to be honest, given like, this is like, you know, like 20 years ago. Yeah, so yeah. the fact that that was a, a thing that she went to immediately, I'm, I'm still, still now I'm like, I'm actually quite, quite impressive to be honest. Given because I think the majority of people at the time would have, would have defaulted to that first. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so like it, I think a lot of the stuff in terms of like the ADHD side of things, a lot of things that I used to do are probably been put down to anxiety or depression, having something to distract from either of those, when there is a whole lot of other stuff that you don't necessarily think of as being like symptomatic of that. So mm-hmm. things like fidgeting all the time and how it just used to drive my wife mental. And 
was extremely distracting any other time, like just sitting. So many like videos, for instance, my hands are under the desk, not like that, like messing with like a paintbrush or like a model or something, like out of shot, basically yeah, yeah. just constant fidgeting. I, I have to be really careful when recording um, Adept is Ridiculous, so I record an episode with them once a month, and I've had to ban one of the like fidget things on my desk because it's got a clicky thing. And the clicky thing <laughs> is the best thing on it. And I will sit there and I'll go to start and I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God. no, no, no. Uh, and then I kind of like move it over the way, drop the mic, like mute the microphone, chuck it, <laughs> and yeah. then unmute so that I don't end up clicking all over my audio track, which would drive shy wild trying to, trying to sort that out. Um, things like just having too many hobbies. Like, uh, the, one of the things that really made me feel kind of daft in not picking up on that idea is seeing a lot of my friends who have either diagnosed or undiagnosed ADHD talk about like how many things they have going on in terms of hobbies and interests and you know how their like their kind of personal space or their hobby space doubled as like a place to build keyboards or to knit things whilst also miniature painting and there's the 3D printer and so on and so forth. And I, I was always like, well, yeah, I mean everyone's got a ton of hobbies. Like sitting there with guitars behind me, with a keyboard in front of me, like a music keyboard behind the PC keyboard, which the PC also obviously does PC gaming as well as editing. And there's music writing software on there. And then there's the miniatures there. <laughs> and then there's, you know, there's like entire like OneNote files full of D&D campaigns and just like writing and stuff. And then there's the 3D printers there. Yeah. And I'm just sitting there amongst all of it and going, yeah, but everyone does this. And having people go, no, <laughs> no, you're, you're like, you're sitting in, like you're squatting in the ADHD den going, yeah, but this can't be that because this is what I do. It's like, that's not yeah. how that works. It's the other way around. You're doing it because of this thing, most likely. Um, and it is mostly just down to the fact of having to do stuff for, for Eve yeah. that even made me think about half of it. That and the fact that, uh, like, I've got to know people through the community who have that same kind of just bouncing all over the place and not being able to focus on stuff and that kind of just moment of being told, look, I know what I'm talking about because I have this thing yeah. that I went through and was told this and you're doing pretty much the same thing. Why are you thinking that that's just how you are yeah. but for everyone else? It's... I guess I think it's the same thing with like there's a huge like swathe of the community being being trans or non-binary and stuff, and the idea of like kind of like the mental image of yourself or like how you see yourself at least, um, and being told that actually no, most people have some sort of like sense of self or like what they are. You not having that isn't necessarily it's not bad but it's also not the vast majority experience yeah you've just assumed that it is because that's what you do yeah whereas actually if you if you look at it in the context of everything else and then actually like research into it a little bit you're not doing what everyone else does and it's yeah. just kind of that realization of oh yeah this has been going on for ages like absolutely ages and there's just been no real clue of it because it's not stood out as being something different comparatively. Yes. Because you've never gone out to compare. You've yeah, never yeah. actually Absolutely. attempted to look at what other people are doing. You've just gone, well, that's just how I am, and that's how all people are, because yeah. surely. And then finding out that that's not accurate, that there is something there that you, you know, if you want to do something about it, you might be able to, or you can at least find out whether your hunch of it is correct. Or you can just look at the list of, like, like criteria for ADHD and go, well, that... <laughs> All but one of those matches, so there's got to be something. The, uh, sort of... the biggest thing for me, I think, is it, is it became uh, an answer. It gave me an answer, which unlocked so many doors. And one of the reasons why I'm trying to talk about it loads is because, uh, personally, I was I, historically was quite hard on myself. Like We yeah. used the word failure before. I think a lot of people out there will probably still continuously, to this day, be being hard on themselves at certain times because yeah. they haven't finished a project, they haven't finished painting a model, or whatever. And this gave, it gave me answers. So one of the one of my one of my big presenting uh, 
one of my big presenting kind of symptoms of, of, of being someone who suffers with ADHD is a hyperfocus. I hyperfocus, I hyperfocus really, really badly. Yeah. So when I pivot into something new, I hyperfocus hard. I'll learn everything about it. I'll, I'll become an expert overnight because I'll just sit there, I'll watch YouTube videos, I'll read articles. And, and sometimes to, to the detriment of the day, so I can get focused on, um, or I want to do something new on the stream. Yeah. Right. Whatever it is, I, I don't know what it might be, but I want to do something new on the stream. How do I? How do I? How do I do this thing? How do I make it work? I remember when I made not the current scoreboard iteration that we have, but the last one that we used, and I learned how to build and write macros and program buttons on Excel that exported to a specific data source, and I learned how to bring that data source into OBS. Like that was two days of hyper focusing where yeah. I basically didn't eat. And I'm sat at the computer reading, and oh, I'm, yeah. oh, his, there's a new thing now. I need to know what a schema is, and off I go and I work out what a schema. And I did all that, and I was like, and I lost two days. Now we had a scoreboard at the end of it that worked, functioned, it worked. It was like a presser button, and then things happened. But I lost two days. Yeah. Now that was a positive, but that's also happened on occasions where it's been a negative, where I lose a complete day, and I'm like, and I'll get to a point. I'm looking, I'm like, I haven't been to the gym, and I haven't done this, and I haven't done that, and I haven't done this. Shit, this day's fucked. Yeah. And, I, and I, yeah. I was really hard on myself, like, why have I done that? Now I'm like, I know why. I understand why. And sometimes I even get to a point where I sit down, I start doing something, and I'll stand up, and, and I'll just like I'll just stand up. And Lisa's like, you're right? I was like, if I sit there and keep doing that now, I'm going to start focusing in on it, and I'm gonna, I, need, I need to do A, B, and C. I'm just going to go and do A, B, and C first, Yeah. and then I can come back and do this thing. And she's like, okay. And first, because I just stand up, she's like, everything all right? I was like, nope, I, I need to stop. Because I'm just going to hyper focus in, and then I lose myself. Yeah, and I think that a lot of people out there that I've come across, adults specifically, most people not too dissonant to our age. And I'm like, have you ever thought about why you do that? Have you ever thought about like why that happens? I'm like, no, not really. I'm like, I think you should. Yeah, because when you get an answer, it becomes much easier. And I want to, you know, there's a word you used about normal. I, I've actually come to believe that normal is a is an oxymoron. Yeah, it's a word that isn't true. Nothing's normal because we're all individuals. There is no normal out there. Yeah. There's so like, I'm like, oh, that what I'm doing here is normal. Well, it's bollocks because like this thing is normal. There's like an expectation of what normal should be, but yeah. most people don't actually fit into it. So not uh, nowadays, like, especially. Yeah. Normal is almost in uh, a, an old society thing where people kind of con like sort of force you to conform to, uh, I guess, a kind of ideology as to what a person, an adult person, should be. And yeah. I think that in the modern world, we don't kind of have those constraints anymore. Um, and more importantly, touching back on something you said about depression as well, we have uh, platforms at least to find people where we share similarities and that make us go, okay, this is fine. Yeah. This thing's fine. But also not necessarily normal because you also find people that go, well, no, I'm completely different to that. Yeah. I, think that's what, I think that's one of the few, I think the internet sometimes is very toxic and poisonous, but I think this is one of those places where it can be a wonderful thing for us yeah, to use. Definitely. And one of the reasons why I love having the channel so much. Yeah, yeah. With when talking about like hyper focus and stuff, something that I've had to start trying to learn to manage is acknowledging that the some of the things that I get like stuck on, or I just decide to do something and then that's all I do. It's not until recently that I've actually tried to work out why that happens and how to stop it. And that's something I'm still really bad at. <laughs> Weirdly, I'm very good at going. Today's not the day I've woken up and everything is colourless and I'm not I'm not just not happy, I'm also not sad. I'm not anything. Like the, yeah. world, the world's dead. Like I, a weird purgatory. Yeah, that yeah. that's generally if I if I have a depressive episode, I kind of start out feeling really sorry for myself, but then it leads to that. If I just wake up feeling like that, I'm like, oh, this is a bad one, but it won't last long. But and I know then to go, we're not gonna record, we're not gonna stream, we're gonna find something that would otherwise like bring a bit of relief and a bit of joy, do some modeling, do some painting. And even though it's not going to work to start with, I know that generally speaking, if I stick with it, it will work. Mm -hmm. I'm still really bad at, at the start of the day, like sitting down, starting something, suddenly remembering I need to do something else. And I'll start doing that. And then something will distract me. I'll see something and I'll click it. And then I'll go, oh, wait, but that's also something that I was going to do. Start doing that. And I get to like, I get to like three o'clock, it's time to go down and pick the girls up from school. And I look at what I've done and it's nothing, absolutely nothing. And I'm like, what happened? What? It's been like six hours and I haven't eaten anything either. I'm really hungry. I didn't have breakfast or lunch. I've just faffed around for all day. What is this? And I've been getting like really, really annoyed about it. And it, it was only like 
at the point of you know going, oh yeah, there's no whole thing about this, isn't there? Yeah. yeah, maybe I should try to instead of just sitting there and then getting angry after the fact, maybe try and learn some patterns, see if I can find a way to break out of it. The other thing is also I do the same thing of just I I have an idea for something and then I just do it. There is a script for a video that I haven't made yet. <laughs> Funnily enough, <laughs> I think the script has been finished for like two months, which is I suddenly had the thought of doing like an introductory thing of like the the law of 40k but instead of looking at the like the details of it instead looking at where it came from so all the influences from like from dune the fact that like the men one of the first mentions of power armor is from starship troopers that that sort of thing like the idea of the rbc's and and judge dread and how that links together and stuff and there is a massive long script that is like half informative half jokey this is it's the law of the imperium but it's where it came from like yeah. what was influenced from where where did that element come from what franchise did games workshop you know copy for this here's the similarities between the imperium of man and the imperium in dune for instance like all of that stuff i really like it i'm really happy with it i haven't actually recorded it even though i lost three days to just writing it non-stop because i finished it and then my brain went that's that done now on to the next thing yeah and then i just never did anything with it you should make that um, video sounds really good <laughs> I do. I yeah it's it's even as i'm saying it out loud i'm like i still think that's quite a good idea banger. i've already done it but i haven't uh, yeah that is evergreen yeah yeah. yeah, I think, I mean, I've, I've definitely had days where, where I, I start 20 things, finish nothing, and then I finish the day, and I used to finish the day going, today's been an absolute failure, that, back to that F word, today's been an absolute yeah. failure, I've, I've actually achieved nothing, uh, and I still, I still, although I still feel that way, I feel better because I know why, at yeah. least. And then sometimes I, I, you know, the kids, like I said, the, the kids are both on the spectrum, they both have forms of ADHD, my youngest is the same, he needs headphones, for example, and it's noisy. I said to Luce, okay, I said, I am perfectly okay with it being a reason. I'm not okay with it being an excuse. So I won't accept it for an excuse for naughty behavior. Yeah. I'm okay with them going, why have I got angry? I've got angry because of this. So cool. We, we, it's a reason. Yeah. I know it's a reason. That's fine. We can use it as a reason. And then what we do is we put in management techniques. We don't necessarily force them to mask. We put in management techniques. We, we get them to learn about how they're feeling and how they got to that place. Yeah. So I, I've had the same kind of days, and I, and I, it, they are frustrating. They're very frustrating. And I get I get to the end of it, and I, typically nowadays, is when I get to the end of it, and I have to do a stream because I stream every day. And I think, fuck, I've done nothing, and now I've got to do a show. Yeah. And, I, and, then, I, and then my mind's like, well, I could not do the show, and I could do this instead. I'm like, no, I'll do the show. Um, but now, because I've got the answer as to why that happens, I'm like, okay, it's, one, it's been one of those days. I've started 10 things. I haven't finished any of them. Yeah. But I've started 10 things. It is what it is, and I do my show. And typically, the show I now find calms me down because I because I focus in on the show, and all the noise goes away. Yeah, as long as there's an audience there behaving themselves, uh, which, which is normal, thankfully. But I yeah, focus on the really. show; all the troubles go away, and I enjoy myself. And that's done. So it's interesting that you do because I think a lot. Of, this is what this is what I'm talking about as well. When I talk about normalizing this, I think a lot of people do the same thing or have the same experience, and then they go they go really hard on themselves. I'm like, no, yeah. no, there's lots of people that do it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of the position I've been in for ages. Where it's just I've just kind of been like, you've absolutely wasted your time. You've just like, what was the point? What have you actually achieved? And then yeah. if the answer isn't like I I either got some form of editing or recording or something done, it's just well that day was it wasn't like used for something. It may as well have not happened. Yes, which is the worst feeling at the end. Hundred percent. Yeah, it's it's just like. I'm getting a bit better at recognizing when that's happening and forcing myself to step away and do stuff. And yeah. One of the things I've found myself doing now is if I start to get stuck in a loop of just like not doing anything or like the recommended tab on YouTube can be the worst thing God. because I will go to look at what like I'll go to look at something I actively want to look up and double check and I will look at it and then YouTube knows I like drag racing content for instance. So it will show that a channel has uploaded something. And I'll be like, ooh, let's say 10 minutes long. And I click it, and it's two hours later. And I'm like, you could have just not done that. Like, That's you know, how like Instagram Reels gets you. It's so, like, ooh, I don't know. Ooh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. And like, you know it's going to happen as well. That's It's the self-control that I'm still working on. Yeah. And it's, I think the, the kind of additional frustrating thing is having such a good self-control when it comes to depressive episodes. 
Like, if, if I can feel one coming on, I can head it off. If I get hit by one by surprise, it like sneaks up on me for whatever reason, I can recognize it's happening and I can do what I need to do to make sure it doesn't impact things too much. And I can make sure that I don't do something stupid in the process of it. Because there's also like an element of self-destructiveness that you get, um, I've found, with like really severe episodes where you know, you'll have days where it's like, well, everything that I've made is terrible anyway, so would it even matter if I deleted all my videos? And it's like... Oh, I have that. It's the, like the intrusive thought is right there, and it's, it's on the lesser end of kind of intrusive thoughts, but it's being able to recognize that you don't actually think like that. Like, like elements of like kind of the idea of like self-harm and things and, and more severe intrusive thoughts than that I've had before, but it's very easy to look at those and go, no, I don't actually think that. Yes. There's a little, there might be a tiny part of me that wants me to think I think that, but I actually don't. And it's, you know, recognizing that and not following through on it in any way is very, very easy. It's weirdly the things that are attached to like creative endeavors that I find more difficult to deal with. So like you should just abandon what this thing you're making right now because it's totally, it's totally pointless or that last video you did was no good. You should go and delete it. Yeah. Like those ones are a little bit harder, but I'm still able to just look at them and go, okay, take a moment, follow through the various steps of, you know, why is it happening? When did it start happening? Is there an actual reason for it to happen? Is it something that you should follow up on if there is a reason for it to happen? Like there's steps that you go through to identify what is and isn't a, like a healthy thought. Yeah. And sometimes, like, one of the things that I, I learned through, like, cognitive behavioral therapy is that sometimes you will think those things. And actually, yeah, you, you would think that anyway. The depression's got nothing to do with it. You could just have a bad day and think that particular thing, and you can trace it enough to go, okay, well, that's just a normal human thought. Okay, mm. great. You can acknowledge that. You know it's come from a place of frustration or annoyance or that something has happened that you are justified to get angry or upset about and then you move on. Um, but even though I've got all of that in place for the like depression and anxiety side of things, and I've got quite good at managing those, weirdly, I don't have the same level of control over the, I'm going to sit here writing a piece of music for a video I'm never going to make for the next eight hours. I'm going to you know write this script <laughs> for three days and then not film it, or I'm going to just flip from one thing to another all day. I still haven't got the hang of applying all of the very logical and sensible steps you put in place to deal with like a depressive episode for those parts of it. Yeah. And you'd think that it would be an easily translatable skill, but I think because it's because for me a depressive episode sucks all of the joy and all of the color out of everything. That in a way actually makes it easier to examine things with a detached like okay, a detached viewpoint because if everything feels when everything feels dead and colorless and as though none of it matters, there is a level of detachment there whereby you can take an individual particularly bad thought, for instance, and just like almost like strip it down and examine it, work out where it's come from, whether it's a, I, I tend to use the phrase like a legitimate thought. Okay. So, you know, if if you wake up in the morning and ever, and you feel really rough, and then you go downstairs, you want to I don't know, like have a cup of tea or something. And you put the kettle on, and all the electrics go off because of a fuse is blown or something. Which I don't know why that example. It's not like 1950, but like that is a reason to actually feel a bit frustrated. It's like yes. I wanted to do this thing, this thing didn't happen. Now I have a problem to deal with that I didn't want to deal with. You would feel that level of annoyance no matter what. So that is a legitimate thought because. It's traceable back to something that happened that you would have an emotional reaction to regardless of the state you were in mentally. It's when you go downstairs, everything's working fine, you sit down and you go, I hate everything about myself. Then there's nothing caused that. Yeah. There's no event, there's no situation, there's no problem. Nothing is actually like triggered that in a in a legitimate way. It is just whatever reason, your brain's just gone, and we're going to really hate ourselves right now. Why? There's no actual cause. And it's working out what the cause was. And if all you can do is just follow through with, yeah, but you are terrible and you shouldn't be here. Why? 
because you're terrible and you shouldn't be here. Yeah, but why? Because and if you get caught in the loop, it's like there's nothing here. There's yes. it's, it's like a it's like a a ghost of an event has set you off, but there's no actual cause for it. It's just that part of your brain is being really loud today. And at that point, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to ignore that part of the brain for today. <laughs> we're not going to we're not going to like address that. We're not even going to. We're going to pretend it's not happening, and I'm going to do something regardless of whether I'm enjoying it right now or not, because that's the best way to quiet it down. It's like there's the. I always I, over the years I've ended up like calling it like the back of my head, where yeah. it's just for some reason the back of my head is being really loud right now, and there's no real reason for it. It's just decided to do it, and and it's the danger zone is when you don't know that's happening. Yeah, where it you. You kind of skip the point where you, where you're able to properly examine it, which happens occasionally. But even then, like the shock of it is quite often enough to go. I felt great yesterday. This is not right. <laughs> like this yeah. is this is. I hate to use the word normal again, but it's yeah, not it's not normal to wake up like this. So yeah. what's happened? Oh, nothing's happened. Right. It's going to be one of those days, and then you can sort of work around it. Usually, again, by just sitting down at a hobby desk or picking up the guitar and just doing things that are. Maybe not easy, but familiar. Yeah, like that. That's the one of the big things for for like just the hobby as a whole when it comes to like miniatures and stuff is the fact that you can just sit down and go, "I want to make this thing," and then whilst you're making the thing, everything shrinks and there's no there's no like universe outside of the space you're in, and there's no there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to think about. What you're thinking about is what you're doing with your hands right in front of you. And that also, for me, works really well to shut out the back of my head, where it's like there's just, I don't exist apart from the eyes and the hands. There's nothing else there. And all we're doing is working together to make some sort of nightmare freak with too many hands. And that's great because all we're doing is this and yeah. nothing else. Perfect escapism. Yeah. It, it's, it's one of those things where I know full well if I'm having a really bad time of it. I'll just say to my wife, Kat, I'll just go, I'm going into the studio and I'm going to go and do something. And I don't know what it is, but I will be back when I've done something. Mm. And she just knows that that means everything's really loud here and give me two hours and all of that will be quiet. Yeah. And I can go back to, you know, being a functional adult, which is isn't always, that, isn't which that is always helpful. Isn't that part of what makes the hobby beautiful, though? Yeah. It's, it's one of the... I've put a couple of videos out now that is just flat out the hobby is it's not just a way to have fun for quite a lot of us. It is a form of therapy. It's yes. it's escapism. It's a little zone that you get to enter where the everything that is bad about either the world as a whole or your world specifically can cease to exist from a bit for a bit. Mm. And as it could be argued that in some ways that can be unhealthy. It's only unhealthy if it means you avoid that. Yes. Or in like the long term, that that's when things obviously become unhealthy. But for a short term, for a whatever this thing is happening right now, I don't want or need to deal with it at this point. It's something that is not going to affect like life long term. It's not going to affect whether I'm able to spend time with the kids or not. Right now, the best way to ensure that I continue being functional, helpful, that I continue being able to take the, take the kids to school, help them with homework, actually spend time with them, is to actually take an hour or two out and use, use the hobby desk as just a tool to, yeah. to kind of excise all of that stuff that is built up and won't go away. Because as soon as you've got something to focus on and you've got a a task that you know well, but it still requires creative thought. It still requires the idea of, you know, interpreting something in a different way than you might. Otherwise, that's one of the things I like about kit bashing so much is being able to take something where I know that that's what it looks like, but I want it to look totally different. Mm. How do I do that? Okay, if I take this bit, I match it up with this, and then if I drive it, that, that doesn't work. But if I try this, that might work. That just becomes all of existence for a bit. Yeah. And then when you come back out of it, Everything else is quiet. Yeah. It's like all you need is the reset time. I know a few people who their reset time is they just walk, they just walk away and go, right, I'm done. No, I've had enough of that now. 
let's go. And then they just hard reset. And I've, I've never been able to do that. Just do the kind of, I have decided that this frame of mind isn't working, therefore I shall pick another one. I would love to have that superpower, <laughs> but I don't have that. I can't do that. I do need the space. But once I've had the space, and especially once I've had that time to just put something together or paint something or like write something on the guitar, or just play along to something like chilled out usually, I can then come out of that zone and go, okay, it's, it's quiet. The back yeah. of the head's quiet. Now yeah, we're good. It's worked. Might need it again tomorrow, but it's there. So yeah. that's not a problem. At all. So so in terms of the um the diagnosis then that you're going through, have you got a like is there a thing, a reason for it? It's most wanting it. It's it's mostly just to know whether it's so it's daft. To know whether it's true, even though I'm pretty sure it is. Yeah. Something I find really helpful ever since I first got diagnosed with clinical depression. As soon as I knew what it was, I found it easier to deal with. Okay. And it's the same with like any other illness I've ever had. Like if I've had some sort of health scale or some issue, as soon as I know what the thing is and know whether there's a plan to deal with it, even if like the the thing is, you, you, you know, you've got pneumonia, for instance, which I've had a couple of times now. Um, I didn't know it could come back. That was a fun surprise. I had pneumonia <laughs> the first time. And then Did you say fun? <laughs> <laughs> Fun's maybe a strong term. It went away and I was like, okay, we're all good. And then like less than a year later, I had pneumonia again. And when I went back to the doctor, the doctor was like, oh yeah, yeah, you go into remission for pneumonia. And then up to a year later, it can just come back. And I was like, awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah, now I've got it again. Brilliant. But even with that, it was like, there was nothing they could do about it, really. It was just be very careful. Don't, like, overwork yourself. It, it, will, it, will, it will go. There's not much we can do right now. But if it gets worse, obviously, then there's things we'll have to do. And just knowing about it, I was like, well, I'm coughing all the time. I can't breathe properly. But I know what it is. Which means I now know that it will stop. Yeah. And that's fine. Even though it was like, it will take a while, but it, it will go. Um, I think actually it might have been antibiotics they put me on. But either way, it was just a case of, we don't know how long it will take to fully go away, but it will. It will go away. Just knowing that, I was like, I feel better about it. Yeah. Just straight away, just instantly, just okay. knowing makes, makes it easier. It's the same thing with the neuralgia where I didn't like reading about <laughs> how potentially permanent it is. But it did mean that at least for the most part, apart from the bit that I missed, like the back of the head decided to really cling onto it, the rest of me went, we know what it is. We've got a plan for management. Now we're good. Okay. That's fine. And it wasn't until it like came back relatively quickly that it like had a negative effect in terms of like the like mental health side of things. But even then, it was something that even though I had that week where I was just like, I can't, I can't, I can't make videos this week. It's not happening. I was still able to, over the course of that week, examine why I was thinking like that, work out where it had come from, and reach the same conclusions the first time. <laughs> I was like, well, I've got the medication. We know that that manages it. We know that if it comes back, I can go back to the doctor and it'll be fine. And once I worked through that a second time, I think it was more just how quickly it came back. I think mm -hmm. part of me was like, oh, it stopped. This is great. And I expected a longer time than like, a month yeah <laughs> and then when it when it was that quick i think that probably kicked off a kind of like a deeper fear that i didn't realize i had um well that but, then leads into the anxiety right yeah yeah but even that like the second time around i was like you already know you know what it is you know how to manage it you know that there are plans to deal with it if it gets worse so yeah. dig yourself out of this hole that you've got into now and remember when it happens again because it will and you don't know when it'll be but You've been through this twice, and it's been fine. So yeah. you don't need to think about how bad it might be because you are literally dealing with it this minute, yeah. and it's okay. Um, so yeah, just just knowing, just knowing yeah. is is well, reassuring I, for whatever reason. I genuinely very much appreciate you being prepared to talk about it as well because I think it's not if you're capable of it. Because I've said I've said before, and then felt bad that if if you have issues with mental health especially, you should talk about it. I actually think that that's, in a way, not fair to the individual because there are those who can't talk about it. And I think it's unfair to expect someone to come out and just be like, here are all the things that are wrong with me. Like, I don't... If you're not capable of doing that, if you don't feel capable, if it's going to make you worse, if it's something that is causing such significant... 
pain, for want of a better term, because you know mental anguish is still a type of pain. It's just not the yeah. same as physical. Um, if you're not able to, then don't push yourself to. But at the moment, I'm in a a place where I can be as not quite detached, but I can look at it from far away enough that I know I'm able to talk about it without it negatively impacting me. That's really good. Like, there's points where I won't talk about it because I know if I talk about it, it will make it worse. Yes. But I find that more often I get more from just saying this is not going well because I know that there are other people who aren't able to say that who will hear it and go, hey, I'm not the only one who it's not going well for. And that, that to me, it doesn't have a negative impact. It just, it sort of, it lightens the load a little bit. Also makes me feel like there's going to be somewhere out there that someone out there that actually feels lifted by it. Yes. And there's no, there's no like negative to it. It's not making me worse. Yeah, I, I, I definitely think that um, I've tried to use the channel and the and the small reach that we have and the space that we have to to, to give people that same experience essentially yeah. to, to to get people to try and to try and get people to go, huh? It's not just me. Yeah. Huh? Someone else suffers with this, and they're okay actually, because I think that that sometimes in itself is is quite a positive message to send to people. I, I've I've now seen a person who I watch, who I engage with, who I maybe respect or whatever. And yet they've talked about how they've had the same issues, they have the same feelings, they have the same struggles, whether that be ADHD, whether that be clinical depression, et cetera. And, they, and you know what? They're doing all right, and they seem to be and they're talking yeah. about it. And I feel like if I can, if one person, after, we've, after we put this video out, if one person, even they don't even have to comment, but says to themselves, that really helped, actually, because it makes me feel, again, I don't like the word, but it makes me feel normal because other people yeah. have had the same suffering uh, or had the same issues or the same you know, experiences. And for me, that's a job well done. Yeah. Um, and I think that I think that people across all manner of platforms, people in much much bigger who have much bigger platforms than we have, and I mean much bigger platforms than we have, are starting to do a similar thing. They're starting to talk about it, yeah. be open about it. You know, we've seen it in in sports personalities, in film stars, in in musicians. And I think that on the whole, that's nothing but a positive movement. Yeah. Um, and I think that. 2024 we still aren't doing a great job in general of dealing with mental health it's better it's a lot better it feels it's like not it's, where it needs to be yeah it feels like it's consistently becoming more acceptable to talk about it which is nothing but positive but i think there's still a few like the attitude of like my parents generation like our parents generation it being the thing of you you deal with it by not talking about it and just getting on with it. It's very hard to break out of that because that's something that is trained into you from, you know, from as as a kid. It's like that being the attitude of the generation before and then them. Even down to like going going back to things like like PTSD from both world wars and it being just referred to as oh, well, it's shell shock. Yeah. And not people not talking about what is effectively massive trauma, and it just being a kind of well, they went and they fought bravely, and then they came home, and they, some of them, well, a lot of them didn't, but then they came home, and then you know they had kids of their own, and the next generation, and so on. It's like yeah, but the people were so horrifically damaged, yep, and were not given the tools in any just way thrown to deal back with into it. society. Just here you go. Yep. There you go. And, you know, you hear stories about, you know, veterans being, having real issues with anger management and and there being a whole, a whole a big number of women who were, you know, assaulted in their own home because of anger management issues from the men who came home. And instead of there being a kind of society-wide, it turns out that actually it looks like all these people have got the same problem and it all stemmed from these horrific things they went through. Instead, it just became a, well, if we don't talk about it and it only happens behind closed doors, it's fine. Which, even to this day, it just baffles me because yeah. I, I really feel like that kind of attitude does so much more harm than good that it's actually unreal because it's not just on an individual level. It becomes like a societal thing that we have now where most people, for the longest time, did not want to say, I'm having a bad day. 
Well, like I, something that simple. Yes. Like, I, I also feel like that there's also this weird thing that happens currently in society in general where people don't want to say it, but people also don't want to ask about it. Yeah. And, and I get it because mental health is terrifying for a lot of people because it's not a broken arm. You can't see it. Yeah. Uh, and so you can't, if you, it, I've, I broke my arm and the bones moved, right? And I went to the doctors and they put the bones back in place and they put a cast on, jobs are good in. And that's it, done. Right? Yeah. You, you know how to fix it. You know what the problem is. You can see the problem, you fix the problem, jobs are good in. Um, with, with mental health in general and, the, and specifically the, the spectrum that exists, and at this point I'm not talking about the autistic spectrum, I'm talking about the spectrum of mental health because it's fucking huge. Yeah. I've done trauma risk management training. It's a huge spectrum. People, I think, and I get it, and I'm not criticizing people for this, but they're also ter- terrified to ask about it, to say, so how does it feel? So what do you yeah. think? Do, what happens in your brain? What's, you know, because, and then, and then we struggle as society to understand what people are going through. But yet, we've said a couple of times today that having the answer or, or knowing why is enough to allow us to cope with it better. Yeah. And I think that sometimes if people out there understood it better, even if they're not suffering from it themselves, they could perhaps cope with the individual situation better. Managers, yeah. for example, I was a manager. And the fact that I knew how someone was feeling was like, cool, I know what you're going through. I don't know, as in I don't, I'm not experiencing it, but I have an understanding, which means I can manage you better right now. Yeah. And I think people are still terrified to talk about it. And there is obviously the very, very small percentage of people that will unfortunately use it as an excuse, even if they're not suffering from it. And those people are fucking criminal, quite frank, frankly. They use it as a get out of jail free card. There's also I've unfortunately experienced a couple of those in my time. Yeah. There's, um, I, there's also the ones who still are of the opinion that if it's not a physical thing, that somehow it's not real. Yes. Which is, it's not as like prevalent as it was, but... That's always been a really frustrating thing when I've seen people go, well, I've never had depression. It's like, yeah. have you ever broken your spine? <laughs> exactly, right? No? <laughs> oh, does that mean that no one's ever broken their spine? Do you want to go around and tell the paraplegics that they're faking it? What are you talking about? That's not how it works. It's not... It, it, that was particular attitude has always really, really, like, yeah. frustrated me. Um, partially, I mean... My dad, bless him. I, the worst ever depressive episode I had lasted, like, a year. And it was really, really severe. And he tried so hard to help. Like he, we went, we went out like once a once a week for lunch together. And he would like you know we'd meet up and and go to the pub and stuff. And he tried so hard to be there while simultaneously having no concept oh. of it whatsoever. Like he just did not understand how it worked. He didn't understand how you could how you could feel so low that you weren't able to function. He didn't understand how it could affect you physically. He didn't understand how, well, just do something you like and then that'll make it feel better. At a time where I didn't like doing anything. Yeah. Because that was one of the core parts of just it sucking the joy out of everything to the point where you physically cannot sum up the energy to even get out of bed because there's nothing there for you. And he did not understand at all. And he said so many times, I just, I don't understand how we can sit here and have this conversation, but then tomorrow, if I come around, you won't be able to, you won't be able to leave the house. I don't understand it. And I'm like, the thing is, I, for a lot of people, you're not going to. Yeah. But you also don't have to understand it to be supportive of the person who's going through it. And you also don't have to know exactly how it feels to be able to empathize with the fact that, even that by itself, there's a form of empathy, which is, I don't understand what you're going through, but I understand that you're going through something. Yes. And if you tell me how you want to deal with this or how I can help, I will do that. Like, you don't need to know, you know, from the top down, someone's complete emotional makeup and state. You can just say, I have no concept of yeah, this. Yes, absolutely. But you clearly do. What can I do to help? Yeah. And if the answer is... <laughs> Don't talk to me and leave me alone. That's fine too. Yeah. You know, if it's, can you do the food shopping for me? I'll absolutely do that. If it's <laughs> checking in 48 hours because the sound of your voice makes me want to <laughs> chuck something out of the window, harsh, but fine. I will leave you alone for 48 hours. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's totally good either way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, like I said, I think it's good we talk about it. I appreciate you being prepared to anyway. 
Um, it's interesting. I, I, you know, I didn't know you started with video games. That's interesting. And that children change everything. I, I, need, I did know that, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. I have had that experience. <laughs> now, but hopefully you guys have enjoyed the chat that John and I have had today. We're, gonna, um, we're about to go into the Thanes Unfiltered section, which is where I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions in WhatsApp that they put out there. Yeah. Because I've just realised that we are two hours and 30 minutes in and we haven't started the questions yet. Good that sounds about right, yeah. This is what I'm I think even some of it was about Warhammer. Okay. <laughs> Like, this is not what he's about, John. Right? No, it's I not, know. That's the I point. Know, know. If you want to know what, if you want to know what he likes about Warhammer, go check out the channel because it's linked below. It's true. There's quite a lot of stuff about it on there. So you yeah, get exactly. A good feel for it. So there's um. So uh, like I said, I, it is going to be linked in the video description below. There'll, there'll be a little at and in, in the name. So click on that. Go hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. I'm sure most of you probably have, and most of you've heard of him. And he pops up in the stream chat quite a lot as well. Um, so make sure you do that because I like your content. Your content is great. I like you. You're great. So uh, you know, the more support, the better. Uh, if you're wondering what we're about to do, though, we're about to go into for Thanes Unfiltered. We have a bunch of membership tiers on the channel from Hasir, which is the lowest value just to get you access to Discord and keep out the fucking horrible individuals in the world who won't pay to go trolling people, all the way up to Thanes and Aces, who are our most engaged, most supportive people, and you're all wonderful humans. They have their own WhatsApp community on top of having access to Discord, etc. And what I do every time we have a guest is I say, what do you want to ask them? And I don't read. Sometimes I skim, just like, okay, everything's all right. I don't actually read them. <laughs> um, and I asked that, I put it out last night, and we have a bunch of questions for you, sir. And there was quite a few. Hang on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine. I'm only slightly nervous about this bit. <laughs> it's about 30 odd, I reckon. Jesus. So we'll go, we'll fire through them. Yeah. Don't, so don't this worry. Is, this is something where you, you've, you've mentioned a couple of times about like channel sizes and stuff. I still maintain the idea that no one should know who I am, <laughs> which is contrary to you know the whole. I'm always like that, like doing YouTube as a job thing. But it's still part of me is always like, yeah, but there's no reason for anyone to actually want to listen to me. Which context-wise makes no sense because yeah, otherwise, why would you even you know <laughs> even agree to do this to begin with? But yeah. there's still like this this weird like I don't think I want to lose that though because I feel like that would be that would be the point at which an ego might develop in some yeah, way. Yeah, that humility, I think, is important. I'd, I much prefer to be of the opinion that if someone knows who I am, it's a minor miracle, and it, it's through no fault of theirs. <laughs> uh, la last year, I went to Warhammer Fest, um, and Lou, Lou said to me, oh, you know, you, how, many, how many people do you think you're going to bump into? And I was like, a couple, maybe? I don't know. I, you know. I knew a couple of people that were going, yeah. so I'll, I'll come and find you at Warhammer Fest, hence my a couple. Um, and throughout the course, like I hadn't got in the building yet, uh, I was in the queue, and I think I got stopped five or six times. And it was, I'll be honest with you, from my mental perspective, it got to a point during the day where it became quite overwhelming. And I, and I, I spoke to Matt from Mini Wargaming. He's like, hey, holding up. I was like, I'm struggling here. Because they all come up, they know who I am, they know my wife's name, they know my kid's name. You know, they know me, and I'm like, I don't know who the fuck you are. Yeah. So I'm not on a level playing field. So I feel like, despite the fact that I'm an extroverted individual, I'm, I'm, my extroversion works when we're on a level playing field. Yeah. Right? And it yeah. struggles when we're not on a level playing field. Um, and I came away from that, and I was like, that is unreal. I, I thought, like, two people who'd yeah. already messaged me saying I'm coming. I thought no yeah. one else knew who the fuck I am, which I was perfectly okay with, so I was not prepared. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to admit, as, as a, a proper introvert, that, like, events and stuff, I, I just, every time I'm like, I don't want to go to this. <laughs> someone's going to say hello, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And yeah. it's like... 90% of the time, they say hello, I say hello back, we exchange names, they say something about liking the channel, I say thank you very much, and then make a joke about how, they, how the, it's amazing that they even, like, I don't understand why you'd watch me, but I'm very glad you do. Um, and then we go our separate ways, and that's generally how that goes. But, like, the build-up to that is always like, but what if I'm horrendously awkward in real life? Like, <laughs> I already am. You know that. You just move past it and hope that no one else notices it's fine. The biggest, the biggest, one of, one of the, there's a few, but one of the biggest gems I ever got from Winters um, was when people come up who do know who you are, talk about them, right? Yeah. And I was like, what? And he went, they really want to tell you about themselves. Yeah. They really want to tell you about themselves. I was like, okay. He went, so if you get them talking about them, then they'll, you'll find it really easy to have the conversation. And actually, what will happen is they'll do most of the talking. And I was like, all right, okay. And he went, also, we, we do Warhammer. They've definitely got something they want to talk about. I yeah. was like, right, okay. So we, I can't remember where he went. We went somewhere, and, uh, and, it's, and it started. And then so I was like, oh, so what armies do you collect? 
And then that's their off. Like, that's what I do as I was well. like, oh, it's working. <laughs> Fuck, it's working. That's... And then they'll get pictures out. This is my... I'm like, this is brilliant. Yeah. And they'll go, they go away and they're like, oh, he was a great chat. I was like, I barely didn't say a word. <laughs> it's, it's, the, it's the best way to do it. It's just, you, you, you're both there for pretty much the same reason. Exactly, yeah. You know why they're watching. As soon as, it's just, what games do you play? What army is your favourite? And those two questions, a lot of the time, mean that you... I don't have to say anything. She's just, <laughs> just, just as well. Yeah. <laughs> well. There you go, little trick of the trade team. Although, don't use that against me next time you come and find me. I was going to say, saying it out loud, that now means that people are going to go, I'm not answering yeah. that. How about you answer my question? And then it's going to fall apart. <laughs> Talking of questions, we've got loads here for John, right? So we're going to fire through these because we are nearly three hours in. Peachy holds the record at three and a half hours, I think, for a stream. I'll be honest, I haven't got all the way through that one yet. <laughs> I need to, I need to. <laughs> so I was like, when I first started the song, I was like hour and a half, like two hour shows, that'll be it, maximum. But when they're, when it's good conversation, I don't want to stop it. I want to just keep going yeah. and keep talking about it. So Could I, it I think half it's half hour chunks and then release it every, <laughs> every <laughs> week. Could, yeah. Uh, right. So uh, I'll say thank you to the person. I'll then read their questions. Some people will post multiple questions. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are serious, some of them are silly. What I say to them is you can ask anything you want, anything. I don't yeah. give a flying fuck if it's your favorite conversion to your favorite biscuit to what do you wear to bed. I don't care, ask anything you want. Um, and then it's up to you if you answer or not and how you answer it. But we'll, we'll fire through these relatively quickly. Quick fire answers for these are mostly the best, but sometimes we'll probably end up talking about something in a bit more detail. So thank you, Adrian, who starts. What is your inspiration as you create some grim, dark shit, which is awesome, by the way? Uh, probably. It depends on something I've, sometimes it depends on something I've seen. So if I see a piece of artwork that I like, like that's how the Armour Company started. I saw a picture of a tank that was done by the guy who's doing Trench Crusade. Okay. And I loved it, and I thought it was amazing. And I remembered I had a half-finished Bane Blade on the shelf, and I went, I could make a super heavy version of that right now. So I did that, and then went, oh, no, I need to make this a whole army. <laughs> um, sometimes I don't have any sort of clear idea. I, I, I always find that I want things to be as, like, or to be as grimdark as possible, and for it to be a bit, things to be a bit nightmarish, like, especially ALS. I, I lean heavily in towards making like more sort of Dark Souls-esque miniatures. I don't necessarily aim to make them look like Dark Souls stuff, even though I love that series. It's more just that's the aesthetic I prefer. Yeah. So sometimes it will literally be a case of, I have half of this kit left. I should do something with it. What other parts do I have? Does this work? Yes or no? And then it just becomes a thing. And there's no inspiration other than I want to use these parts. And I want to do it now. Like, yeah. One of my favorite ones that I haven't even got around to painting yet is uh, a Mega Gargant that is built out of a Terrorgeist, which has got six wings instead of two, except they are Stormcast wings, so they're a lot smaller and they're feathery. Um, and it's got a pair of swords and it's standing on top of a huge chunk of scenery. And there was no idea for that <laughs> other than I've found these other two bits of actual like ruins that I want to put on some things back and then cover it in candles, because that would be a cool look. And that was the only reason I built that model. And there was no idea, there was no like, sort of, I have a plan, it was just, I've got these two bits of scenery, I've got this Terrorgeist body, what else have I got? I don't know, let's see what happens. And then... Amazing. Yeah, that happens quite a lot. Well, there you go, honest. Adrian. The answer is, there is no inspiration, it just makes <laughs> shit. <laughs> makes me even more it's jealous. random. <laughs> Carl, thank you, Carl, says, in your expert opinion, does Joe or Liam have the best beard? Oh, that's difficult. I feel like I feel like I feel like you've got the best beard. Oh, uh, because I'm job. here though. No, Joe's no. is now bigger and fuller, but he takes a lot less care of it. it, it there's a there's like a groomed element. Yeah, that I think is important, mm. which I lack as well. But, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Adrian then said, "Why did you choose Joe?" Well, fuck you, Adrian. He didn't. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, thank you, James. If you could dye Liam's hair and or beard any colour, what would it be? Not beard. I don't know why. I don't like... I dyed beards freak me out and I'm not yeah, sure I'm why the same. that is. I, yeah. It just doesn't it look looks right. Weird. Yeah, exactly. It, it right? <laughs> I don't know why it being like under the face makes it weird. But it Above the eyes? Is. Okay. Below yeah. the eyes? No. I, d I don't know. I think it would like... Lighter would look weird and I don't know why. Yeah. I think because the beard's lighter, doing lighter hair would make all of you look... Yeah, massively change everything. Yeah, I think probably like just a darker, like a black or something. 
Right. Oh. That, that, that would probably be, I, I don't know. That or like really fluorescent pink. One of, <laughs> one of the two. <laughs> I've never dyed my hair ever. Actually. One for shock value and one for. I might go bright for, white. <laughs> the pink is. Pink is the best one to do if you want to see what it looks like if someone's murdered a fairy in your back. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Just black, James. Like my, like my heart. Uh, Sam, thank you. She said, if you had to type, if you had to be a type of cheese, which type, which type would it be? Probably, probably something as mild and inoffensive as possible. <laughs> <laughs> if I was going to eat it, a blue cheese. Oh. If I was going to present it to someone else and wanted them to actually, you know, put it near them, just some sort of decent cheddar. I, I, we went to cheddar on Friday, and I have some cheddar at home from cheddar. That stuff, I like. Is amazing. It. Um, and then Sam says, a more sensible question, what's your favourite piece of lore, either from Games Workshop or one that you've written? From Games Workshop, <laughs> there's lots of little bits that are kind of silly that I really like. There's, there's, a, there's a short story for the Alpha Legion where they infiltrate their own base. And I can't remember, I can't remember what it was in, but I remember it being, it's so beyond silly, yeah. like even by the standards of Alpha Legion. But they infiltrate their own base to destroy it, and I forget the context for it, but the whole thing is like, oh, actually one of the Primarchs is here too, but of course it's not. It's one of the other Alpha Legion operatives who's been programmed to believe that he's actually the Primarch. And for the life of me, I, I can never find it. And I like I have it reinforced to me that actually it is real, and I haven't just imagined <laughs> it. But I remember reading that short story and just being like, Someone was really, they were yeah. on one when they did this. It's like they looked at all the memes about Alpha Legion and went, I'm going to make all of that true. <laughs> that's a book. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely a book. Um, that, that all the entirety of Scars, that entire book, I really like that. Yeah. I think they did a great job with White Scars as a whole and having them have their own secret little incredibly fast maneuver that they pull off was a nice moment of over the top kind of 40k style thing but in a in a slightly different direction to usual yeah um for, for most of it it's like it's either horus heresy stuff that has done such a good good job setting everything up or it's you know little little daft things like tusker demon killer um or just the older bits of law that have kind of vanished now that, yeah that don't make any sense in the current format but it's the things that have made like the building blocks for what 40k is at this point. Yeah, it's yeah. like I don't think you can have what 40k is now without those discarded bits of some of them like, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, I agree. I think I think my favorite piece of lore is probably the Kyphus Kane based novels and specifically around like I love Jurgen the character in Kyphus Kane. Yeah. The blank who is literally a fucking idiot. But he's always there when he needs. He just wonders. Like, like I just I have this imagination of they set the scene in the forty first millennium of how incredibly grim and dark and terrifying, and that the average lifespan is about three minutes in this universe. And then you've got this buffoon just like meandering around, like bimbling, <laughs> yeah. bimbling through life, but somehow surviving. I kind of love that. Yeah. Because uh, sometimes I feel like that's me. I'm sort of meandering around, bimbling through life, and kind of surviving. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what happens. Thank you. Anyway, Sam. Luke says he's got. There's three parts here. Uh, one, two, three. Yeah, three parts here from Luke. If you had to choose between tanks or dreadnoughts, which would it be and why? I'm on a, I'm on a really heavy tank kick at the moment. Oh, I'd pick tanks. But I, mm, the dread mob that I had was really, really fun. But <laughs> I've, I've, like, I've, I feel like I've done that now. I have got enough dreadnoughts to make a 2,000 point list again. I just haven't got around to finishing them all. Uh, story of every single project on my hobby desk. Um, but I don't know. There's... It might be tanks, May mostly because there are so many Forge World ones. Sorry, not Forge World anymore. Fifteen plus resin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Forge World. That, yeah, that I I really want to add to the armor company I've got. There's just a random bit of lore for that armor company. There is a reason why none of the tanks have got flamers. I know that probably having heavy flamers on the Lehman Russes would probably be better than heavy bolters, but that is because the um, Malkador Infernus, the, <laughs> the stupid Forge World one that's just got a gigantic flamer on it, and that's its like its only weapon. Um, I just randomly decided at the start of the Armored Company that there were going to be no flamers 
the only flamer would be on that tank, and that tank would belong to an Inquisitor, and only the Inquisitor gets to burn witches, everyone else has to shoot them. So the entire force is just built around like heavy bolters and stuff, purely because of a stupid bit of law that I decided on the spot, oh, and then just went hard commitment into, and then was like, I feel like I've kind of, I may have potentially messed myself up here refusing to put heavy flamers on any of the six <laughs> Lehman Russes I have. But on the other hand, it would be really cool when I do have that model done to put it down and be like, this is the only one that gets to burn people. To be fair, <laughs> heavy bottles are okay right now as well, so you're all right. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'd go tanks, but then I just fuck it. I've always loved tanks. Super heavy, have been especially. To, have you been to Bovington Tank Museum? Yes. What a great place that is. One of Joe's favourite places. Yeah. Uh, he then says, what is the most important ask, or ask, sorry, what is the most important aspect to you when deciding if a model is a great sculpt? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I feel for a lot of them, it's, it's so individual. Like, yeah. like there, there's so much, there's things like level of busyness, for instance, like how much detail is on. On some models, it's overwhelming, but on others, like the context has a huge amount as to whether that's, a good or a bad thing, um, like a lot of the, a lot of the newer Stormcast models, especially the sort of like uh, what are they called the Requi, Requ Relic, no, the newer ones, the yeah. super heavy armor looking looking uh, Stormcast that I can't remember the name of. It begins with an R, and I can't remember what it is. Um, they're quite busy. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of armor, like armor paneling. There's chainmail. There's there's cloaks and fabrics. There's like decoration and stuff, on them it works really well because compared to other Stormcast models, they look like a step above. Yeah. They, it adds to the stature, like the level of importance they show. But for like the new de the newer Death Guard models, I know you said new Death Guard models, but they're not new anymore, are they? No. <laughs> it's just time goes too Shamefully quickly. Not. I don't it's like just it. Just feeling old um, now. Yeah. yeah. Like the Plague Marines, not that big a fan of them because they're too busy. Because for like, like rank and file infantry, for things you're going to have a lot of, the monopose style of it makes it too repetitive. The sheer amount of detail on them means that they're a bit sort of, there's just a bit too much going on for a squad. So even things like that, where it's like the level of how much detail or how much extra stuff is on a model, even that is so like context dependent. Yes, 100%. That it's, it's kind of hard to like quantify, I guess. Yeah. I think sometimes you just see a model and just immediately like, that looks incredible. And it might be something that on other models you're not that big a fan of, but it just works. Yeah, I think um, for me it's 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 so subjective as well, though. Yeah. Um, so, like, and you have it in your hand. I would always say don't judge it on GW's pictures because the pictures are often terrible. You Sanguinius have it in your hand. is the best example of that. Yeah. I hated Sanguinius, the, the, the Forge World one. Yeah. It looked so derpy, and the pose was awful. And then... I saw pictures from other angles, not just like kind of horizontally, but also just the model was turning. I think they put like a 360 spin of it. And as soon as I saw it from any angle other than the one they put in the initial article, I was like, that looks great. Angron was the same for me. As well, it has been my favorite Legion in 40K. When Angron came out, I was like, oh, he looks a bit, I don't really, I don't really like that. Yeah. And then Jay built the model and was like, there it is. And I was like, oh my fucking God. Looks yeah. So yeah, so I think I think I think the problem with that question, unfortunately, is it's so subjective. I guess I, I guess for me, it's if it if it does it correctly reflect the narrative behind what it's supposed to be showcasing, yeah. essentially, because most most models are built off of already ex existing narrative. Yeah, so I guess that's it. Like, that's a hard question, Luke. I it like is. it though. Uh, he then says his final question here is for someone who reviews the live reveal shows. Something, by the way, they've continuously tried to get me to do. But I like my bed far too much, and now they do them all in America. For someone who who reviews the live who reviews the live reveal shows, what recommendations would you make to make it more engaging and enjoyable? And I think he's talking about the recommendations to make the live review yeah. shows reveal shows more engaging and enjoyable. It's, that's a really difficult one because one of the main one of the main problems that I've had with those shows, which actually I think have got a bit. Production-wise, they've got way better. Yeah, agree. They look better, they sound better. The format of them, I think, is actually better. Primarily because when they had two live commentators, regardless of who they were, and I'm not like 
I've had to clarify this before as well. I'm not trying to like throw shade at Eddie or or, or Adam or anyone. Oh, I do all the time. Um, but <laughs> they they they're not allowed to be themselves. Correct. They just can't. They are contractually obliged to be what Games Workshop wants them to be. Agree. You can't have two people doing live commentary on something as subjective as miniature reveals in terms of, you know, everyone's got their own opinion on how things look, what rules are good, what codex should come next. All of that is subjective, not objective. So having two people who could only be positive doesn't work. Yeah. Be because you're not getting them. You're getting the opinions of Games Workshop, you know, TM, filtered through two people who are trying to present as though they are streamers without being allowed to actually do anything other than what they've been told they can do, which is why you ended up with, you know, minutes of effectively dead air where there's just talk about what's your favorite thing of all the things we've seen? Well, I like everything that we've seen. Well, yeah, you would, you've, you've got to say that. And, uh, it's not like them being bad at it on purpose. I think you can't hamstring someone when it comes to doing a live broadcast and then expect it to be as good or as They're... relatable or as impactful as someone who's independent. Doing. Like I can sit there and go, that looks, what the hell is that? That's not great. Okay, well, maybe if we look at it from another angle, whilst at the same time someone else is going, oh, another fantastic reveal in a slightly deadpan voice yeah, because yeah. they're not allowed to say anything else. They also, they also, the problem I think they also probably have is they also know this much and can talk about this much. Yes. So then they have to be so incredibly careful as to what they do and don't say. There has to be self-censoring going yeah, on. Yeah, and I'm like, that seems like a, like, why would you do that? Yeah. Because they're like, oh, we can't talk about this part, we can't talk about this part, we can't talk about this that we know is coming, so we, we actually struggle to give you the excitement. Yeah. I, and, I, and I also find it's a live reveal show, and the two people that are doing the show, whoever they might be, have seen these for months. So the excitement's kind of died a little yeah. bit. Yeah, it, it's that, that whole format. I understand why they did it, because as, <laughs> as we know from sitting here in your studio, which you've built up from streaming, personality-driven, like, like front-facing content does super, super well, especially in the context of Warhammer. But you can't do that if you're a corporation yep. who makes it. You just can't. That's not right. how that works. Nope. Um, so, in terms of like the overall format, the new ones are better. Like the sounds better, the lighting's better, the set is really good. The way they've done it with like staging it with interviews from the actual designers and stuff is it's still it's still very hamstrung by the fact that obviously Games Workshop is making it and it's all their staff and they can only say a certain amount. But the structured nature of it means that it's less awkward than yeah. it being done live. That being said, they also, for some reason, someone in that studio has bought like a setup, like a, a dolly rig or whatever, and they've learned what panning and zooming is, and they've never looked back, and it drives me up the fucking wall. The last two reveal shows they've done, we've done a counter in the top left of the screen, counting how many times the miniatures pan across the screen like that, or they zoom in like that, or they do a dolly shot like that. Because it's every single picture is just pan, dolly, pan, do over and over and over again. To the point where the first, I think it was the Adepticon reveals was the first one where they tried that new format of having it all pre-recorded, one present and so on. And I was like, has anyone been able to see the miniatures yet? Because I can't see them. Because yeah. they're permanently going left to right or right to left or getting a bit further away or going up and down every single time. They and we ended up doing a counter for it and just counting how many times they reuse the same shots and the same like setup. And it was way better the last couple they did because they did actually show just the miniatures occasionally. But for some reason, once they changed over from doing like the more live format into this much like more heavily produced version, someone went, should we put just some pictures of the models up? And everyone else went, no, they don't need that. We do need that. Yeah, we do, we that. do need that. Like a, a still image is so much easier to pass than a moving one. And given that when you're streaming something, I know internet speeds have got a lot better, and obviously they're not going to have cheap rigs or whatever. But there is a like it's still compressed. It's still like a lossy format. And yeah. So if something is moving, you will have compression attached to that that obscures details. Even if it's just a little bit, it still does it. You don't get that from a single static no. image. So if they brought that back, that would be a lot better. I think they're probably, 
for what they want to do with it and for what they can do, given the context of it's their models, it's their reveals, it's their staff. I think what they've got now is probably the best they can do, but it would be better if they let someone else do it. <sighs> but they would never do that. <laughs> I don't know, John. Like... I, I I agree. I think it would be better if they let someone else do it. Um, I I think I watched the last one after the fact, and I was like, "Oh, great! It's the politicians again." And what I mean by that is they say a lot without actually saying anything at all. Yeah. And I'm like, "Well, I haven't learned anything apart from you showing me the models." Yesterday was it? Yesterday, the day before? It might have been yesterday. It might have been Sunday. I don't remember. But Call of Duty, uh, Triarch, the studio who have made the new Black Ops Six, which is coming out later in. The- Aside, by the way, the new Black Ops Six is coming out later in the, in the year. They, uh, so I think it's the end of this year it comes out. Did a live reveal, right? Did yeah. A live reveal show. So in in terms of context, it's basically the same thing, and they are fucking leagues apart as to how they presented really? it and what they've done and the whole thing they put together. So you watch that Black Ops Six reveal; it's exciting. You get energized for it. Um, they've got the people that made it talking about what they've made and why they've tried to do what they've tried to do. They've given away a lot of information without actually giving away too much detail. They've kept the things that need to keep secret secret so people can still get excited. The fucking chat was all wildly excited because it looked so good. I'm like, that's how you hyper product. Yeah. That is how you hyper product. And that's why that's a multi-billion industry. And why yeah. at the moment at least aren't doing a very good job. And they're hyping their own product. They're still talking about their own game and their yeah. own product. And I was like, wow. And not only that, here's the other thing, right? Here's the other thing that they did. The, uh, the second that reveal, I think it was Sunday evening, the second that reveal went live, was the same time that certain creators' NDAs lifted. Yeah. So straight away. So you still can't buy the fucking game. In. Not until yeah. November. Yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. six months away, and creators went, I played it last week, <laughs> and it's fucking incredible. So you're like, the hype is already started yeah. six months away. Um, and so what happens with us is, there's a live reveal show, and then some t- two to three dullards sit there and go, yeah, it's a new model, in it? Like, cool, thanks. And then they go, right, sweet. Well, I... Summer 2025, maybe, probably. But then you do also get to see wrestlers play it in the worst set. <laughs> right, as a person who live streams games, just move on for that one very quickly. Um, thank you, anyway, Luke. Richard says, what is the most expensive kit you bought to, just to use for a conversion? This is going to be a terrible number, oh, isn't it? I'm just trying to... I mean... Individually, I don't tend to go that wild. It's it's the it's the mix of them that is really like bad sometimes. I mean, probably probably the knight I did the chaos knight that's got the the chaos warhound um, Vulcan. Gun. Oh wow! Um, that was that was stupid because that that one gun. It was the Vulcan Mega Bolter for the Chaos Warhound. I bought that just to have a Chaos Knight hold it. Um, which, like, that model ended up being, I think it was all the other parts. Technically, if you took every kit at, like, retail, it was like 220 quid or something for a, for a Chaos Knight, because there was also parts from a Custodes Dreadnought in there as well. Fucking hell. Um, and so much green stuff as well. And the Vulcan Mega Bolter, which is by itself... I mean, it was before price rises, the lack of <laughs> price rises, so it was only 45 quid. But like 45 quid for the gun yeah. is like, I think probably proportionally that's that's the, the biggest that's offender. That's pretty pricey, yeah. Um, Just for a gun for another model. 45 quid for that. And the thing is, it didn't even work very well to start with. I had to do some heavy modifications to make it stand up because it's a brick of resin. It's not hollow or anything. It's just one solid chunk. There's no parts. So it meant that it pulled the entire knight forwards to fall over. And even on the base, it would tip the base over as well, just because of the knight, the gun needing to be held in front of it. Yeah. Because it was like holding it two-handed like it was a heavy bolter. Um, so then I had to take the knight apart and I had to repose the leg so that it was bracing. And then I had to pin it to the base and then pin the inside of the torso to the legs to make sure that like it Fuck that me. by itself was was Ridiculous. This, this is why I don't do kit bashing. <laughs> it's so much fun. <laughs> I'm sure. Is it worth it? In time investment. I mean, you have yes. some of the coolest models out there, so you, I think we could probably say yes. I'm breaking even on that one anyway with the, the Mega Gargans because my Mega Gargan army to date has cost less than if I just bought four Mega Gargans. So 
you know, yeah, there you go. Saving, saving money. money. Saving money, if anything. <laughs> he then says, down. tea or coffee? At the moment, mostly coffee. And then red sauce or brown sauce? Oh, that You can't just choose between the two. That, that, like, if you're having a bacon sandwich, it's brown. Yeah. If you're having fish finger sandwiches, red. You can't. Yeah. There, there's no way of just. You can't just pick one. <laughs> if you just if you have to pick one, you may as well just get rid of both because Breakfast. they're not both applicable. Brown. Red brown. Yeah. Yeah. Dinner. Probably normally red, but again, depends what it is. Yeah, if you're having actually. sausage egg and chips for dinner, brown. It's got to be brown. That's got to be yeah. 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 Hundred percent. And the Americans are going. What the fuck is brown sauce? Yeah. <laughs> because I know the Americans are saying that. Because after he posted that question, one of the Americans went into the main Thanes group and went. What's brown, brown sauce? sauce? <laughs> That's where you say, oh, it's Houses of Parliament sauce. Yeah. And that doesn't mean anything either. No. So. Uh, Jay, it's like, thank you so much, Richard, you legend. James says, what is your preferred filling? What is your preferred filling in a breakfast roll? Ooh. How, how, I mean, how many are we allowed? Because the That's preferred one is bacon, egg, and sausage. Oh, and sausage. Yeah. See, I'm, I am partial to, partial to bacon and egg in a, in a roll. If, if I'm going to, because I very rarely eat breakfast, if I'm going to do it, do I it properly. Do it properly. I do like crispy bacon, a fried egg, you put the bread on right, and then you bite it without having cut it yet or cut the egg, and it yeah. just explodes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I'm hungry. We need to go eat soon. <laughs> yeah. I'm fucking starving. I'm thinking like Fridays or something. Anyway, um, where is it? Uh, so thank you, thank you, Nick. I really enjoy your first reaction videos to new models, especially when you really enjoy them. What current sculpts do you think has the greatest potential for a spectacular glow up? Oh, where do you even start? Half the Eldar range, <laughs> like yeah. the Phoenix Lords, for instance. They could do in insane, brilliant things with those. Grey Knights, just as a whole, feel too squat and too short now. Agree, strong, and, strong. I mean, agree. They're cool models. They are. They're really. But they cool. do need scaling up. Yeah, they like, need to get the Cassell and Crow treatment. Yeah, uh, especially the Dread Knight. That has the potential to go from being kind of trash to actually awesome. The baby carrier. Yeah. Yeah. I really don't but I I just don't like the justification of it, which sounds kind of petty, but the whole is protected by a force field. And the rest of it isn't. Or like or no one else is. But yeah. it only applies to the dude on the why would you not just have an enclosed thing I think like every other vehicle? What you do just, if they do a big grey knight glow up, I'm gonna really struggle not to not to buy into that. Yeah. To I mean, see. if they took the dread knight the same direction that they went with the nundams, that would be that would be yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. Okay, there you go. Uh, Dan, what is a video idea or series you've always wanted to get off the ground, but you didn't attempt to due to YouTube's algorithm and whatnot? I don't know if there's anything that I just haven't that I've thought about trying but haven't done yet. There is something that I've been thinking about for like a couple of weeks that I really want to do, but logistically it sounds like a nightmare. Yeah. Which is, I know, you say you're doing a 40k podcast as if you know there isn't enough of those already, but I really like the idea of taking a couple of people, probably three, rather than doing like a big panel, um, and having, this is totally stolen by the way, I should preface actually, there's a podcast I listen to that kind of do this already. Um, but it's three comedians and they take a prompt from their listeners and then they inform about whatever the subject is. And obviously they know nothing about anything yeah, that yeah. they're saying. I really like the idea of doing a, a like a Warhammer themed version of that, where you have a few people who know the game, who know, you know, the law. The audience suggests whatever law, like bit of law or like obscure detail or thing, or like maybe something that is quite old at this point. To explain, you're not given any time to research. You're not allowed to look anything up. You get given the thing that you are going to talk about, and you do your best for 40 minutes. And it's not going to be good. Like in terms of like the information given, it's less about being accurate with the law and more about can you develop something that is a entertaining, b sounds like it could be true, and c is also <laughs> quite funny from someone saying explain the origin of the something pattern bolter. Like, how would you even begin to go about that unless you had time to research? You don't have time to research. You just pick it out of a hat, and then you're off. That's a You've great idea. But again, it's like the logistics thing of, of getting that together, and then, like, where would it go? And would it be its own channel? Would it show up on other people? Like, it's, it would be a lot of fun to do, but it also is, would be super dependent on who was in it, because there are some people who would thrive on that and some people who would just 
freeze up and not know what to do. So it'd be a case of trying to find a good like cast for it, I guess. Yeah. But I've really wanted to do that for a, for a good month or so. But that I sounds just fucking amazing. Just don't know where to start. I love that. That's a great question, Dan. He then says, if you could pick one current Games Workshop system to stop and one to bring back, what would they be? I'm going to upset so many people. I st- stop kill team. Okay. And bring back Mordheim. Oh, interesting. Okay. Or nah, I say that Battlefleet Gothic. That's what I'd bring back immediately. Uh, I'm I'm like I'm really like horribly split because I I want to see both of them come back. I didn't get to experience either of them, but I love the look of both of them and I've you know, I I've been like pushed into trying them at some point. Um for like for both and both would look like games workshop has got so much better at sculpting and miniatures since like more times glory days and same with like battlefleet gothic the miniatures still look good but the level of detail they can do now is so yeah. much better than it was they would look incredible as long as they didn't tamper too much with how they worked then it would probably be fun to play at the very least yeah i really want both of those to be a thing but i don't know which one i'd want more I th- I'd want Battlefield of it more, I think. Yeah. Most definitely. Because I, I think we really miss a cool spaceship game. That's In terms true. of stopping... We do have, like... Yeah, I mean, we we do already have plenty of, like, skirmish options, I guess. I'd stop Old World already. Really? Only because they fuck the release up so much. Are they doing anything else with it? <laughs> I'll be honest. That's I... a very good question, John. None of us know the answer. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, Daniel Legend Kieran uh, says, when, when is the Kyrgios guitar album dropping? I mean, we talked about, you know, jumping from one project to another earlier on. I've, I've thought about it. I've got like <laughs> things recorded, but I don't know what I'd do with them. Lou's got me a guitar for my birthday because that's what I asked for. I wanted to play guitar. And I've, I think I've maybe had like four practice sessions and I was like, wow, I've completely forgotten how to play guitar. Like really forgotten how to play guitar. Uh, it's like... I don't know what I'm doing now. It's really bad. Um, so yeah, maybe soon then, Kieran. Perhaps. <laughs> soon to be on Spotify. Uh, and then John, Carl and Richard thought they'd try and be funny. So John said, who is Kyrgioth? Carl said, why is Kyrgioth? And Richard said, what is Kyrgioth? What is, where did the name come from? I'll actually, I'll, I'll actually turn those three into a sensible question. Where did the name so, come from? I used to play World of Warcraft. Okay. And I had a rogue called Carnival. And I went to look at my rogue on the World of Warcraft Armory page where you can see what stuff your character's got just whilst I was out and about one day. And I looked, and there were like 11, 18, 1,000 pages of other characters called Carnival with like, like a lot of them being rogues. And I was like, oh, man, everyone uses this name. Every single World of Warcraft server has got like this. Like, that's kind of unimaginative of me. How did I manage that? Oh, well. Decided to start a new character, again with this friend that I had the gaming channel with, um, and I made a paladin, and I decided I was going to have a name that no one else had. So I went onto the armory, and I went through like one of those big long lists of like, I think it's like a biblical name or something, maybe? Um, and I just went through finding ones I liked the look of, and then put them into the armory <laughs> to see if there was another character with that name, got to Kirioth. Put it in. There was no characters called Kirioth anywhere. And I went, that's it. I used that name for that character. Then we started writing a blog about it because, you know, World of Warcraft in its prime blogs <laughs> were a thing. It feels weird, like <laughs> actually having, like trying to chart the idea of where you end up and what you were doing before and stuff. Um, and we used our character names as opposed to our actual names. And it just stuck. Okay. It just never went anywhere. So it's because I used to play World of Warcraft. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. Um, Sean says, best guitar you've ever owned and why? The, uh, yeah, it'll be the Chapman Ghost Fret that I've got. I really, really like that. It's Sean's into his guitars as well, so he probably knows what you're talking about. I, I, it's a guitar brand that was started by a YouTuber, funnily enough. I don't actually really follow him anymore. I kind of found that I found a bit, a bit grating after a while, but the actual instruments that he was making or designing with the help of the community. So the way he got started with making guitars was he just asked the fan base, what do you want in a guitar and held a bunch of votes and then built the guitar that the most people had voted for effectively. 
Um, and after a while, he did an Explorer shaped guitar, which was the Ghost Fret. And I tried several guitars because I wanted to buy something nice with inheritance that my nan had left me that would last, that I would just keep. Um, I tried a few different guitars and found that that was the most comfortable. It was the most balanced. I liked the sound that came out of it. It was the most versatile. So it's, I've got other guitars. I always end up going back to that one. Every Amazing. single time I play, I end up going back to that one. Okay. There you go. That's why then, Sean. Sam then says, favorite string and chord? Favorite string? Low E. <laughs> and chord? Uh, oh, I don't. I, see, I'm bad at theory. This is the thing. I don't know chords. I, use, I, I play tab. I, I can, can't read music. I can weirdly like map out what it is on the fretboard, but I don't know what the chord's called. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not Don't helpful. worry about it. <laughs> Alan, thank you. He says, if Games Workshop were ever to make a YouTube signature series, what would you like the Kirioth inspired model to be? And what would Liam's be? That's a great question. Um, I mean, I would, this is going to sound really, I'd want something like chaos -y, something really eldritch horror Lovecraftian that even if it just had my name on it, no. that, that would be, that would be really cool. That would be fun. I mean, that's the kind of thing I like to make. Even when it comes to like smaller characters and stuff, I tend to angle towards making them a bit more, a bit more like gritty and dark fantasy. Yeah, yeah. So even if it was just like a, a character model style thing, I would want something with like a good number of like chain, chains wrapped around a shield or a weapon, also like flowing cloth, that sort of thing. The kind of thing I like to paint, basically. That's cool. I okay. feel like you've got to be some sort of like <laughs> raging barbarian, surely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why though. Wow. Other than the kind of the like Viking feel to the the set and stuff. Yeah. You yeah. get that that for that reason and not for a <laughs> Not for a person. <laughs> well, okay, well. It's more, more the branding than the attitude. Yeah, of course. That's right. You said it, John. That's right now. Well, nothing, nothing but a raging barbarian. All right. <laughs> Ross thanks. Is, who would win in a fight? A bear or a shark? Well, where's the fight though, Ross? We need context. If they're in the water, the shark's probably going to win. Yeah. But if they're in the forest, the shark's probably fucked. I mean, if they're in a kid's paddling pool, is that an even match? Is that... <laughs> <laughs> a draw, oh. the shallow end of the local recreation and who, what, what type of bear as well? Like if it's Yogi, he's got no chance. If it's a koala, I'm definitely putting it on the shark. <laughs> like, <laughs> just, just... Thanks Ross, anyway. Uh, Zachary says, I, and I assume he's saying, well, which one would you rather fight? Because he's put 10 <laughs> mini space marines, approximately three foot tall, or one giant space marine, approximately 60 foot tall. I feel like it'd be dead either way, honestly. The 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 tall, like the really big one would be quicker. Go on, quicker death. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You just stamp on you, you'd be gone. That'll be it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Zach. Jill, you're leading an army of mangy foxes into battle. What are you kit bashing them with? <laughs> Great questions today, chat, by the way. <laughs> Thanes, you're knocking it out. You've you've started working out what this question thread was for. Yeah. You're getting there. Is it is it with is it with like cockfighting where they strap razor blades to the legs or something? Because I reckon with the right kind of rabid fox, you could <laughs> you could do some damage. The right kind of rabid fox, <laughs> well, you know, wrap him in barbed wire. <laughs> yeah. If you were turned into a bat for a year, where are you living? A cave, a farmhouse, an attic, or the bat house at Chester Zoo? Very Chester Zoo. Yeah, get fed, definitely. Yeah, get That's an easy nicely. one. Yeah. Less chance of something murdering you, you'd be fine. He's got weird people looking at you. Uh, what gravy is the best gravy? Oh, uh, onion. Oh, onion gravy is... Uh, okay, yeah. All right, good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was your most disappointing kit bash? She's coming with a sensible question right at the end. I don't know. There's been a few that I've finished them and gone, that's... Bad. Um, <laughs> I tried to make I try to make a like a an arch majos out of Lady Ollander from the Nighthawk range. I tried to make basically a copy of some artwork using that kit. And I started it without really thinking about what I actually needed to do to achieve it. Didn't have the parts I needed. The parts that I did put on realized belatedly that I didn't like how they looked. And she is currently in a Tupperware on a shelf, buried under other stuff. Because I got to the point where I was like, "If there's a way to salvage this, I can't think of it right now. 
I'll come back to this later. It's a future me problem. And then I think that was like two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just still in there. Okay, there you go. Lady Organ. I mean, in concept, in my mind, it sounds like a really cool idea. But Well, that's the thing. It should be. But I went in without like preparing anything yeah, and yeah, with only course. like a couple of kits that would have worked. But like the the... <sighs> The art had like a hand holding a, a sword aloft. There was like a halo. It also wasn't like a robed figure. Like there were robes, but their head was bare. And there's, I don't, if there's a way to convert Lady Olinda to having a bare head, I couldn't think of it at the time. And there's like lots of long spindly legs and stuff, which I was like, oh, I can use this Necron kit for that, which I didn't have like have at the time. And then when I looked at it, realized that actually the legs didn't match at all anyway. Like it was just. One of those things where I had the enthusiasm, I had the drive, I started it, and then went, I had no prep for this. Yeah, and yeah. It shows. I was not ready. Yeah. Uh, James, thank you. So if you. By the way, thank you, Jill, for all those. James says, if you could be any animal, what would you choose? Any animal at all. Yeah. Or some sort of dog. Oh, I love a dog. Just a, a, a medium, a medium dog. <laughs> a medium mixed breed one that isn't going to get like hip dysplasia or something yeah in a decent family yeah yeah <laughs> that'll do and is that says, a service he's offering now <laughs> <laughs> who is your, yeah you get literally patted on the hat every day patted on the head every day you get given treats don't have to do anything who is your favourite 40k character and why is it Erebus <laughs> that's not accurate no I'm not having that um, <laughs> <laughs> Joe hates Erebus too I like Erebus to be fair I think he's I think he's one of my favourite like <laughs> absolute arseholes in fiction because he's just terrible all round but in an entertaining way um, I'm not I'm not I still think Lorgar is just one of my favourite characters that Games Workshop has ever done mm. I, I just I think there's there's something I like Lorgar there's something like he could have been like pure I don't know how else to put it he wanted to know he wanted truth he wanted answers he wanted to enlighten the people yeah. He just got lied to constantly. He did everything that he could as best as he could and just got like ignored and insulted for it, like disciplined for things that he thought would, he was doing a good job with. I don't know. I just, he felt like, a, he feels like a very human character. Yeah. In a series where there are a lot of human characters, but of all of the big, larger than life ones, he feels like the most rounded. So not quite Erebus and James Lorgar instead. Not, not quite. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, though, mate. Sean says Belgian waffle or stack of pancakes. Stack of pancakes. Stack of pancakes. It's the right choice. Well done. We can stay friends. Tom says, <laughs> oh, fucking hell, Tom. Who would you fuck, marry, kill out of Liam, Bricky, and Luton? <laughs> I never, I see, I've never met Luton. Have you not? No, I've never actually met him. I've, I've, I've talked to him a fair bit, but I've never, like, face to face. So there's, like, there's no real connection there, so I wouldn't feel that bad about <laughs> But if you went. No, that's not. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, he's had a cup of tea in my office. <laughs> nice guy. Is that a euphemism or is that... No, no, no I don't. actually, was a cup of tea. I didn't have to fuck Marokko either of him. <laughs> I I mean, I'd have to kill him just because there isn't the level of like personal connection there. Yeah. Um, Ricky, I reckon probably... <laughs> I'd probably marry Bricky because he's so busy I'd never see him. <laughs> He's got like he's got like two channels. He streams. He does adapt as ridiculous. Like he's he has no free time. I could do whatever I liked. We all really know why he's made those two choices. <laughs> yes. Team. Just saying. Look, I, I try to, you know, dress it up and make it so Additional but... content coming soon. <laughs> uh, thanks, Tom. Dan, name a content creator you'd most like to fight in a Weatherspoons parking lot. <laughs> most like I mean, I feel like Phrasing it most like to, there's an implication there that yeah, there's someone I really don't like. Who would like. you like to absolutely chin in the content creator world? I feel like I feel like me and Mikey could monetize that like nothing else. <laughs> I feel like we could do really There is well a lot of, of people, and I mean a lot of people, that would pay to watch Mon Mikey get punched. Um, <laughs> he says, do the same again, but for an in-law character. Thought he was going to stop. Do the same again, but for an in-law. <laughs> <laughs> I get on with him. It's fine. It's, <laughs> no, an in-law character. So it could be Erebus. He wants to fight the parking lot. Although he's a space marine, he'd probably kick your ass. I think he'd be worth it. Yeah, get so one, could, like get one good shot. One in. good hit on Erebus. Yeah. I'm into it. Thanks, Daniel Legend. Jake, there's three more to go. Jake says, "Tell me your favorite 40k army in and lore, 
and why is it no yes tell me your favorite 40k army in law and why is it imperial knights they do a lot of this <laughs> yeah tell me your answer and why is it this one i mean kind of close i think probably the favorite is still chaos knights yeah yeah i i, I like the again it's that whole thing of like nobility that's been corrupted of a whole the idea of them being protectors that have then turned around and become bloodthirsty, crazed. Yeah, that I'm actually, I really like that. I am actually a big fan of Imperial Knight narrative. Um, I think it's Mechanicus or Mechanicum or whatever, which is the, the heresy book, which yeah. covers the Titans and stuff like that. Is awesome. Like the Princeps, in my view, I really like. I'm really into that kind of stuff. Actually. Yeah, it's just a shame that for 40k in general, we found that knight content doesn't do that well because it's all knights and people are like, oh, knights, a bit boring. Yeah. Which is true because I fucking love Imperial Knights. Yeah. Cool as shit. Proper big, like just humans in giant mech suits is cool. That is the next army that I'm doing. So. <laughs> yeah. And then, oh, it's, that wasn't Stevens was a reply to that one. Giant stompy robots that aren't warped into a thing of abstract horror. That's Imperial Knights. He wants Chaos Knights. Too. So finally, Joe says, what is your favorite metal band and the album you relate to the most? Ooh, that's. There's a lot of I listen to quite a lot of metal. I'm in, I'm in that weird that weird uh, like Spotify rabbit hole phase. Oh, of of just I'll start listening to a thing I I want to listen to, but I'll set it to radio, and then I will get bands I've never heard of. Yeah, that also really that's like, amazing though, which I love. But it's it's become a thing where there are <laughs> there's quite a few bands I've found recently. I could not tell you what they're called. But I do know that I really like them. And if I looked at my phone, I'd be able to find one. Um, I think overall favorite metal band at the moment is Flash God Apocalypse still. Which okay. I, I... But... I don't think there's any one album that no, really I, like lingers. I there's, could pick a couple of bands out. Most of them are quite mainstream. Um, but a single album? I'd, I'd really struggle with that. Yeah. I, there's... For me, I don't think there's any like particularly perfect album. Actually, no, that's not true. No, I'm I'm telling an absolute lie. There is. There is one album that I will listen to front to back every single time and not skip through, which is uh, an album called Fire by the Silos by a band called Tosca, who are no longer a thing, which makes me sad. Um, which is, it's just an instrumental album. It's just um, guitar, keyboard, drums, and it's more sort of like, more kind of like, Rock, rock than than metal, but there are some really like heavy, chuggy riffs in there as well. And for an album that has no lyrics, no vocals whatsoever, apart from a bit of like narration in a couple of tracks, they've just done like an insanely good job of building moods. And it feels like an album that tells a story, even though there's no That's words to any song. And I will listen to that i've got the vinyl of that i will listen to it just every single time i feel like i want to listen to one of those songs i listen to the whole thing yeah that's incredible cool there you go that's the, that's a great they actually were suitably crazy today <laughs> they normally like really sensible questions and stuff like uh with peachy and, and jay the really sensible questions it's like no this isn't the point i mean to be fair with peachy there's an entire like Oh, legacy yeah, of of, yeah. of things that you want to ask isn't there so. you've been absolutely incredible <laughs> So thank you so much for coming all the way down here for this. Not a problem. It's been an Anytime. absolute... Well, I, so for, for, for every single guest I've had so far, I'm like, I, we don't have to do this once. We can do this more because I'm sure we could talk for... I'm sure you and I could literally talk for fucking days, actually, <laughs> yeah. for that matter. So yeah. we'll, we'll obviously happily have you back. If you guys haven't already, I've said it a couple of times already, his channel's linked in the video description below. Um, I think I, I can link anything you want to so Twitter, etc. But check out the channel. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already because... John's a legend in the community. I was watching him long before he knew where the fuck I was. Um, and I, you should go check it out because it's cool. Um, and uh, that's not it for content from us. Uh, at the time in which this goes live, this will have already happened, but we're going to be doing a live stream tonight where you're bringing your tank company, yeah. which looks fucking cool. Uh, and I'm going to be running sisters because they're on preview right now, so I'm probably just going to get blown off the board with tanks. But it'll be fun. We'll have some fun. That relies cause... on me remembering what I'm doing. <laughs> oh, no. Don't you worry. We don't know what we're doing. This is what we literally do for a living, so you're fine. Um, so if you haven't already, you can go check that out because it'll be up on the channel on demand. But thank you so much to everybody who's watched the video. Uh, if you've got any questions, queries, comments, anything you want to say, check it in the video description, not in the video description below, in the comments section below. That makes more sense. If you've enjoyed the show, please make sure you hit that like button for us. And if you feel like it, maybe share it around a little bit because I am trying to change those sub numbers slowly. I'm trying. It's not yeah. really happening. 
Yeah. When I launched the Peachy video, they went, whoop, and they went, way. I was like, oh, it worked for about a day. Cool. Just get him back every week. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I offered him a job. He said no. Uh, so if you, um, what was I saying? If you saw this on the first day, it went live. Like I said at the start, thank you so much for being a member. You guys are amazing. If you're one of the fans who will ask the question, thank you so much for being some of our most dedicated members. You're amazing. You've been incredible. Much fun. I'm looking forward to tonight. Actually, we laugh. But I am also now starving, hungry. I how could long, eat. How long have we gone for? No. Um, the the actual runtime. Have we beaten Peachy's? The actual current record time is three hours, 31 minutes and 55 seconds. Oh, I think it's going to come out under, isn't it? I think it's going to come out come just out under. under once edited. Nah, close so, enough. Yeah, I mean, it's a, <laughs> it's a title. Yeah. Uh, anyway, like I said, you've all been amazing. Thank you so much for watching this. We'll see you in the next one.